Board Chair Wyrick. Here. Board Vice Chair Farmer. Here. Board Member Daddy. Here. Board Member Hilgers. Here. Board Member Hansen. Here. Ms. Hansen, would you honor us with leading us on the sure. pledge? Thank you. I have had a um, request for a, uh, uh, I guess you would call it a, pr a procedural only um, agenda item addition. Board member would like to make a, a board communications. It's a standard item to have on agendas. So uh, uh, I'll go, I think it's okay if I make the motion to just add the board communications agenda item to the and see if I get a second, Mr. Fletcher. I'll make that agenda for, to add board communications to the agenda after public communications. I'll second. Okay. Any, um, all in favor? All right. all right, we'll move on now. First item is public communications for members of the public to address uh, the, our uh, building appeals board on items of city business other than scheduled agenda items. And again, matters raised by this time at this time may be, may be discussed, but will generally be referred to staff and are placed on a subsequent agenda. Uh, we cannot take action on non-agenda items. Are there any public communications for things not on the agenda? And if uh, I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to hopefully just, if it's okay to take a chair privilege here, there's very few people here. For those that wish to speak to agenda items, we'll just, uh, you can do, do so by just raising your hand when we get there. If you have a comment on agenda item, come forward. <clears throat> so uh, move on to the consent item which is minutes of the Building um, Appeals Board meeting of September 16th. Uh, I want to appreciate the very great job on the minutes being very clear uh, and organized, and I appreciate that very much. And are there any amendments? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Well, we have a motion to approve. Second? Second. By, by board member Hilger. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, moving right along. Mm -hmm. Informational item, we have, I believe, our new ombudsperson, Judy DeVore, to do a status report for us. Can you please come forward and tell us how things are going. Good evening. Hi, thank you for inviting me to come to give this report. The report is short. Uh, I was appointed in June and uh, have had no inquiry since then except for one, uh, two property owners, one parcel, and they had previously been in touch with the city for this program and really are awaiting the pending changes that they've heard about might be in the offing, waiting for things to settle in as I am. And then when I know how it all works, and I understand from the last meeting that I took a look at on video that you'll be doing some outreach, and I'm ready to help out with this program once it gels. Seems not quite gelled. So the folks that I did speak to did have one particular question that maybe you could 
just help with. And that's uh, to give me, so I can give them an idea of how long the whole process, start to finish, once an application hits the city, how long should it take to get a yes or no? I, I don't have an answer, although I can say that one thing that we're working on is to try to shorten it <laughs> with these with these proposed changes that I think we're, I think that's one of the, the the purposes is to try to shorten it. Uh, I would defer to staff if there's an answer to what we've had five process so far total that I don't know uh, what the average length of time or can we characterize the length of time uh, either Ms. Wald or Ms. Herbeck on how long each of those has taken in the past. Well, I think it's on a case by case basis. I think the zoning conformance should be done, you know, relatively quickly. Right. Sherry can ask. That's kind of the easiest part of it when they come in, and then depending on it, we're doing this inspection process now. So maybe Steve can talk to that. But depending on what items they have to correct via the inspection, then that would dictate how long it's going to have for you know for them to take. That's kind of I think within the um, Proper owners control, though, so I would right. say, you know, that, that if they wanted to move fast, that they could probably do that and be so, done in a month, you so know. So net of correction items. Yeah. We have a, a, a guesstimate, and I, a please, I emphasize guesstimate of what in-house uh, in processing time would be. So an application is going to come in. It's going to come to the planner first. Sherry's going to intake it. Then it's going to come to the planner. They're going to do a zoning conformance because they have to submit a site plan that shows their setbacks, et cetera. That's going to be done probably within the first week, I would say. Um, you know, depending, we have part-time staff, so depending when staff's there, but somewhere within that first week. Then it's going to be referred over to building, and building's going to go out within a day or two and do an inspection. So net of... of uh in-house processing time we're talking about a matter of two to three weeks uh, to be well i think that 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 that's a critical point in time because then i'm not talking about conformance right time um because then once that inspection list goes then they're then the way the program works is they sit down with steve the building official and they kind of get an idea of what this is going to cost them and then they make the decision of whether they want to actually do the work so they actually Defining the process for each individual homeowner should no. take just a week or week and a half, too. So basically they could get a, at least an initial response mm -hmm. of what they need to do to get into the non-conforming status within, with certainly less than a week, less than a month, and hopefully two to three weeks. And I just add the caveat that, you know, of course, if we were flooded with all kinds of people, exactly. then, then, get, then it's like in the grocery line. You're standing in the queue and you right. wait your turn. But once you get to the turn, right. that's what it would take. Is that any helpful? It's something. It's something. It's exactly. something. It sounds like you know there are a couple of stopping points along the way, right. with variables that you can't really predict. So I understand that, but at least it gives me some way to think about it. One other question. Yes. Uh, I've heard people express a concern over the. Well, what is the basis for the city's assurance that if a, a homeowner does not succeed in this process that they're not going to be put on some list or even with the change of the guard you know change of policy that this list of non-compliant illegal rentals is not sitting someplace waiting for someone who wants to issue citations or worse tell them to you know tear it down because I do know just from a little bit of conversation I've had on this, there are people who are relying on the income generated by s these rentals. So that would be a disaster. So I guess my question is, is the city in this planning process um, contemplating creating some sort of, and this is the lawyer talking to me, I should not even say, creating some sort of document to give a homeowner an assurance that this is not going to happen. If, I, if it were me, I'd want something, you know, that I could feel comfortable relying on if I just either couldn't come up with the money or the process started and stopped. I mean, things happen. And then there someone would be worried, you know, like you talk about the program is to maybe get a cranky neighbor off the back or something like that. Well, some people might stay away from the program thinking, you know, I might get caught at something wrong that maybe there's a tolerance for now, 
but down the road there might be less. So I don't know if that's ever come up for discussion, but it's something I think that property owners are concerned about. So in other words, they, they want some sort of legally binding non-retaliation. That's what I'd recommend. At least that's okay. And you uh, know, something with some teeth, not just someone at the office saying, "Well, we're never going to." You right. know, it's too big a deal. Um, I think. Would Mr. Daddy, would you like to? Um, yes, I'd like to make a comment. I'm not sure where this is going to be appropriate. Um, the prior Umsbud person before you um, made a pretty blanket statement um, publicly that if anybody came in and inquired that they would not be referred to the city for any action. Now, I didn't hear anybody refute that, and that has been a number of months ago, and they were before this board in open session, correct, Sherry? Yeah. He made a blanket statement that I'm, I'm not really sure how valid that is or under what authority, but that went out and it was never refuted. Um, I, I guess I would have a little bit different uh, concern. Uh, I, I went today and I looked at, I have copies from the sanitary department, of 58 residents that paid over $900 thousand dollars worth of sanitary department permit fees that were all copies were given to interestingly enough the county which would be the assessor's office and mm -hmm. and to our city and uh, they've been sitting around some of them for two and three years with absolutely no action taken i don't know what type of precedent that sets but I do know they have paid their money, and I'm not an attorney, but it just, it's kind of out there. And I'm wondering if we have 58 of these where the people spent the money and went through the time and the trouble, um, what type of process and why we're not trying to assist those people first. And I'm going to defer to one of our board members who in the past has made an attempt and uh, I, having looked through all this material, I'm still unclear that we have a process that we're ready to follow, having reread the Planning Commission meetings, minutes, where they want certain things and they're uncomfortable with setbacks and parking and a number of other issues. Uh, I'm wondering if it's not too soon to get in there and tell people that, hey, we have an active program ready to go, it's all set, and you're gonna qualify in A, B, and C, and here's a list of 10 items, and if you qualify eight out of 10, you're good. I don't, I don't believe we have that checklist. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something we're striving for, and certainly every bit of input you can give to us would really be critical so we can maintain, so we can have contact and be in touch with what our community standards are gonna be. Because this is really more about community standards. We know they're not compliant. We know they're not permitted. We know they are here. We know some have been here for 40, 50 years. Some have been here for four or five years. But the community standards, so you know, the more you can tell us, the more we can try to wrestle with this thing because it's definitely not going to be easy. This is, this is going to be a tough one. Well, Thank you. I, I've read kind of the back and forth on this and see the confusion. It's not confusion, but it's just an unsettled, it's unsettled. And um, this little piece though, I know that everyone, it seems there's common ground that everyone wants the community to participate for whatever reason, state numbers, local issues, affordable housing, all the various reasons that it'd be good to have more housing have, just have more and have them safe and and all of that so to me one way to encourage that as I said would be to give some reliable assurance you know why no one has done anything about those homeowners that have paid those fees and done those hookups I certainly can't speak to but um, I don't know that that would be a precedent for not in other words, if the city came after someone in a year and they said, well, gee, they never did it before, well, that's not a, it's not a novel argument, but I don't know that it'd be a winning argument. I don't know. Can I, 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 I hate to do this, but I'll kind of raise a question in, in response to your question. I see certain distinctions 
you know, there, it's one thing if it's non-conforming because it's, uh, you know, uh, has a problem with energy efficiency standards or something like that. There's another, but there's a whole other category of problem if there's a real acute health and safety issue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, how do you handle uh, no retaliation without putting the city in a very difficult position of walking away from an acute health or safety condition they become aware of? Uh, this subject came up in conversation one day, and I said, you know, again, I, I have to say I look through this through a lens of uh, my prior work as a litigator, and I would see that the city might have some exposure there, frankly, if they actually went out, saw the wires hanging, turned their back, said you didn't pass, we're not going to, you know, you can't make it in the program, and then and we'll never talk about it again. Exactly. And then there's a fire. Exactly. There's a you know a mishap. If I were plaintiff's attorney, and I'm naming everybody, you know, within <laughs> a big radius, especially a municipality, if there's one there, you it would be malpractice actually for a lawyer not to name the city. And so then you get into the issue of you have a non-retaliation with a, a basically an exclusion. Right. And does that become a barn door for, you know, abuse, or at least the perception of that? I mean, this is a thorny issue, I think. It's a very complicated one because there are some ramifications of saying to an owner, you know, if you can't pass, we're not going to keep your name someplace, which is a tacit approval of the dwelling. Yeah. Without any question, that's an approval if you've been there and then you... You observed, and you said, and you denied their application based on those facts. Well, you can't later say I don't know those facts. And then, you know, if something were to happen, there would be a significant exposure. So I think that's I, just I my think point. our our city attorney would like to weigh in on this. So oh, uh, I'm sure. Please, please stay at the podium, Thank Mr. You. Fletcher, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, my understanding of the process is the this issue about about what happens if I can't bring my property up to, up to standards. That was, I thought, the role of the ombudsperson. The idea is that they are not, um, they've got an arm's length relationship with the city, and the idea is they meet with the ombudsperson who helps them through the process right. and tells them, hey, you look either, not gonna happen. You know, you've, here's all the things you're gonna have to do and it's gonna cost you whatever. And you can say thank you very much and never come into City Hall. The theory is that we don't know that information. So the code enforcement department, no one has, no one has that information. Right. Um, there's absolutely no way that the city can be bound not to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. But at least there's no record. Mm -hmm. um, but once the person, if they meet with the ombudsperson and they go through the process, go, okay, I think, yeah, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a run at this thing. Then they apply, and they, you know, the inspection requires, you know, there's on both the code issues and the building issues, there are appeals to the two respective boards. Right. And if the final decisions are something the property owner doesn't want to comply with, th there's absolutely no way there can be any sort of representation made that that the city would not enforce the law. Now the option, you know, the discretion to enforce the law is vested in the officials, the enforcement officials. Um, but there's no way um, that we can issue any sort of assurance, estoppel document, or anything that your property is, we are aware that your property is not permitted, may have serious public health and safety, health, health safety is issues with it, and that we're not going to enforce the law. The idea was that the, the we, that's not going to, the, 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 the protection for the, for the property owner is the ombudsperson. And what about the protection for the ombudsperson yeah. for a health and safety issue? The th theory, now this was the, the program was put together before I became city attorney, but I was here when we put the, we, we adopted the program with the first housing element and the second and upgraded the second housing element. Um, that they are an independent individual, not an official, not a city official. So they're not covered by the sovereign immunity of the city. That's the theory. Okay. I, I, and I again, I haven't been asked to render that, but the idea is there that, that I never, think she raises a good question. Yeah, she raises a good point, but never gets into city hall. Whether and 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 that is an important point of why the the, the role of the ombudsperson, the fact that they are there as a community members pre-screening these uh, right. properties um, to to give someone some some independent and autonomous 
advice or Correct. feedback so that so when they decide to cross over the threshold in the city hall that the, they have full, some full at least some knowledge mm-hmm. of, of what right. their risks are right and Correct. that was the protection and they they could they could walk away after meeting with the ombudsperson and and, and, and nothing has changed. Now, that doesn't mean, and, and the program said, you know, and if at the end of the program, whenever it ends, the city reserves the right, to, all properties have to come up to all current codes. Right. How we enforce, and I've been city attorney in a lot of different cities, and the whole issue of enforcing second dwelling units is one of the most thorny issues in local government in California. So, you know, going out and doing some sweep of no, I, unpermitted I units not not something we know it hasn't been a priority in, in in a lot of communities but i there's no way we could issue any sort of document or representation that you are exempt from future enforcement for two reasons one well, I, we can, yeah. it is we can't not agree enforce the law and the second one because the city council is the legislative head of the city you're right politics change and policies change and we can't, you can't bind the hands of future city councils to change the law or policies of the city. Judy, I believe you had a follow-up. Briefly, um, I might have to resign. It's a pleasure. You know what? No, really, <laughs> really. When I uh, volunteered and I spoke <laughs> with Rick, I said, you know, I wanted to get crystal clear on what this position is. And my understanding, and I'm reading from the the document. Uh, independent facilitator to assist the prospective applicant in determining the potential of receiving a compliance permit. Okay. I don't know how to do that. I don't know about electrical. I don't know about all that stuff. And I was told, well, you don't have to know about it. If they decide they want to do it, then they're going to go to Sherry and she'll run it down. Well, I don't want to turn somebody off to the program if they're, you know, potentially good for it nor do I want to encourage a bad one, I do not have the skills Mm -hmm. to make these determinations. This says a preliminary consultation. It's fatally vague, you know, in terms of if I'm going to define what I'm doing and if I'm the first contact and it tells the person yes or no, uh, that's a big responsibility, and I need to have I need the guidelines, but I need to understand what I'm doing, and I have to be honest with you, I don't know about uh, health, right. co- the safety codes, and I wouldn't know a violation if I saw it. Yeah, um, Ms. Wall. Yeah, let me just interject a little bit. I think the intent of the Osbudsman, and Rick did have some experience. He, you know, was, I think, uh, a contractor. Yes, he previous was. Life. He is. But yeah. I think the intent of the Ombudsman program would be that, you know, you c- um, depending on the seriousness of the issues with the second unit, for like electrical, you could easily tell them if you're unclear about what the status of your unit is. I mean, obviously, if you go out there and somebody has a has a legitimate structure that they've only um, adapted for a kitchen, so they've added you know plumbing and that kind of stuff. You know, then you would say, okay, so you need to know: did you do that work? Did you have it done by a you know licensed plumber? You know, blah blah blah. You might want to have somebody. This is what you'd have to do. You need to hire somebody to come in and do an inspection. You're That's talking what they're about. The full disclosure role. I'll right. I'm just saying for the ombudsman, we're not always going to have an ombudsman who has contractor skills, but they're going to help the person say, okay, how do I evaluate the cost or what's wrong with my unit? Mm-hmm. And that person would just walk them through like, okay, so how did the unit come to be? What have you done? What do you know about it? All that kind of fact finding is what that ombudsman could do. They could still turn them over and facilitate them to a contractor to do like a home inspector. Right. It opens that, up the possibility of an inspection that still it doesn't get to the city. Right. And I think that that a person needs to understand, you know, the 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 thresholds of okay, you know, how serious it is and you know, so I and mean, I don't know that we're always going to have an ombudsman who has the skill sets to do plumbing, electrical, et cetera. Right. They just need to know, okay, this is how you, you can get a home inspector, and they run generally between this and this, and here's a list of them, and you need to have that. Just like probably if you have somebody who, if you're in real estate and you say, you know, what, how do I determine if this home has issues? Well, you hire a home inspector. It's kind of the same thing. And I think we could work out those kind of rules and Makes kind sense. of triggers, you know, kind of an outline. 
that those p- people would have to talk with them and then, and then the homeowners m- thinking in their head, well, okay, okay, okay. And I was just going to add the same thing that um, Mr. Fletcher said, which is, is the program has always said this is, a, this is a compliance program. They don't like the word amnesty, but it has a beginning and an end, mm. and that's the intent. And then it says in clearly here, um, after the ordinance ends, we will, we will implement all ordinances in effect, not limited to all permit fees, construction standards, zoning requirements, and penalties. Right. So it's clear okay. that, there's, yeah. that there's a stick at the end of the line here. Right, and I think also the fact that the, uh, we're trying to develop a checklist system facilitates what you're talking about. What I would request for me, if you still want me to have this spot, yes. um, is I'd like a checklist that then, if, if, if you get all these checked, then let's talk about getting you a, an inspection. Maybe as there'll be a volunteer in the city. You know, you can put that out there, some contractor exactly. that yeah. wants to volunteer their time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they don't have to pay $250 to an inspector, but someone to go in and can do that then secondary preliminary. Right. And then let them go to the city. That's the so. And uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, if, if, if I may just interject. Uh, Mr. Farmer actually oh, I'm sorry. had a comment first. Yeah. I'm trying to go in order here. Yeah, I have people I'm, getting I, my attention. So yeah. I don't want to take anything. I, I, no, no, just, you know. Yeah, ahead. Judy, I can appreciate what you're, you know, what you're saying about, uh, you know, knowledge of contractor. I was under the understanding, I guess I thought, that our ombudsman would have some contractor knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I don't care. Okay, don't really understand why we haven't pursued that and look for somebody with somebody with knowledge such as uh, Rich, you know, when Rick was out. I don't think you had a lot of volunteers. Right. <laughs> Our main, I think I might have been the only one. <laughs> and it doesn't preclude someone working with you on that regard either. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Yes. Um, I'd like to have the opportunity to sit down and talk to you about, you know, some basic understanding of how how the technical side of this uh, fits together mm-hmm. um, the other thing is that the previous ombudsman would not disclose to me an actual owner or address but would come in quite often to discuss a technical issue that I could respond to and they could go back and evaluate that so I would love to sit down with you before you decide to uh, resign and but- <laughs> and, and see what uh, thank you mr. Stewart thank you very much and uh, and, and and please please stay with us and and I but I think what I want to say is great questions which makes me think you're going to be great at the job you know are great at the volunteer what's not a job right, we don't get right. none of us get paid for any of this but uh, great for the the contribution you can make to the community on this so if you could Find me stay with us a little longer. I'll be patient. I'll wait till it all gels. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, all right, Ernest. Uh, any concluding comments before we move on to the next agenda item? Okay. The next agenda item is the um, discussion item. Uh, discussion and recommendation to City Council for changes to the City of Ohio's second dwelling compliance program guidelines. Um, if any, any of you, um, I think the minutes pretty much from the last meeting e- explain uh, where this is coming from, and I want to commend. Um, I'm very happy that, that I believe that, that Ms. Wald really took seriously the direction that we were suggesting and some of the questions we were asking and got involved. Uh, she made herself available for some time with, with me one-on-one in terms of looking at options that other communities are following. And so um, what we have here is, is, is the um, uh, uh, staff response to the direction from the last Building Appeals Board meeting. And I think it uh, would be most appropriate first for Ms. Wald to give us an introduction, and then we'll start a, a round robin of uh, comments. Ms. Wald? Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And I would just like to say he um, kind of covered my um, staff report, and we just kind of exactly what uh, was just previously said, which is, um, before you tonight is a working draft, and it is a draft, and um, I've called it draft three and given it a date. I know we get a little confused with all the drafts we had, so hopefully that we can keep that straight. Um, so what I've done is separated it out um, from a planning process, which would be on page 2 of 14, 
talked about the modified zoning standards. One of the important items to note with the modified zoning st standards is that it's an all-inclusive list. Instead of saying these are modified and you have to go back to the ordinance, they're all in one spot now. One of the things we added was the deed restriction and the applicant agreeing with a sworn statement as that it's owner occupied. Please note that this is kind of still in the working um, um, draft and um, on item K on page three, we have the deed restriction shall contain the statement that the property may apply to the planning commission for relief from this deed restriction based on property owner demonstrating a bona fide hardship. We probably need to define what that is, but this is a working progress document. So, you know, it's incorporating some ideas and some new innovations in there and so they need to probably be fine tuned. But so that's kind of where we are with the zoning standards. You will notice in these zoning standards that the parking still says compliance unit must, may satisfy its parking requirement through common use of parking provided for the primary residence or use of on-street parking. Parking space provided for the second unit shall function independently from the parking spaces provided for the primary unit. And that's just really important that they're two separate units. I don't have to go knock on the door and ask somebody to move their car. But I want to point this out that use of on-street parking means that we're not holding people who have converted their garages to providing other parking. So that issue of garage conversions and how do I meet the parking criteria is kind of gone away. Now, I think one of the things that if you watch the meetings from the Planning Commission, one of the things that is really important is this idea that majority of these rules and regulations are really trying to address the units we've had out there for a significant long period of time and the basic theory that the Planning Commission was operating on was that most of those impacts have already been absorbed by um, the neighborhood. I don't think we'll see that sort of leniency when we, when we start working on the actual second unit ordinance because now we'd be talking about new units and how it impacts um, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So yeah. a lot of things have been removed, um, the size of the lot and all those kind of constraints have been removed because they were, they were actually multiple constraints that somewhat then when you imply one on top of another on top of another there's just a little, or if you graph them, let's say I was visually, if you graph them there's just a little section that you would actually find compliance. Instead the overall um, leading um, sort of uh, um, um, constraint would be lot coverage. So, so if you're not, if you're not one, overburdening your lot, you know, if, if you're following all the lot um, coverage that is in your zone district, whether you've added um, space onto your home with an addition or it's a second unit, it's still the same intensity for your neighbors as long as the unit is compliant with the standards and that it doesn't exceed 1,200 square feet, so we're not talking about another large home, you're still maintaining the same amount of open space and lot coverage. So a lot of the other multiple cons constraints that were there before um, have all gone away. And then um, I think the other thing of note is the, um, we ha uh, is the setbacks. And that really has to do with the setback from you to your neighbors and building separation between the primary and accessory. And that kind of comes down to five feet between the units. Um, or I think it says reduced if you've constructed a properly rated fire separation wall, you know, trying to give a little bit more leniency and, and, and you know, unit, unit separation from property lines. And I think with that, I think that's all it's really important um, to note. So I think that now we're just down to its very simplistic um, zoning regulations. They're very straightforward. Um, and with that, we move into the building division pr process. So let me start by saying that the direction I had from um, the board and um, was to <clears throat> establish this sort of in-service date, um, uh, let's see, a, a, pro a protocol or a process where we would have some way of um, identifying in-service date. Remember, we characterize this in a very s first sentence of this program by saying it's a way to legitimize, legitimize dwellings that have been constructed without record of permits. So we're just saying there's not a record of a permit. So we're doing this in service day to try to identify a range within a range, a year that the 
that the second unit came in, into place, whether it's the assessor um, identified it and, and was taxing it, whether you have records that show that you were renting it. Um, however we're going to do this, there's a whole series that come later in the program. Um, and then that helps us identify the code that's going to be implemented, that's going to be utilized to then look at the checklist. So I hope I'm making that clear. So we have that, so please note that each application must have a completed in-service date affidavit and accompanying documentation. So this is one of the things I think the ombuds, ombudsman can really help facilitate. It's like a person's going to get very frustrated. So how do I tell somebody when I did this unit? And there's lots of different ways. And so I think that, that uh, people might not even be aware, I mean, what they have that may do document how long, you know, maybe when dad made the unit, he kept all the receipts and maybe he never got a permit, but maybe he kept all his receipts for materials and maybe there's family photographs, you know, that are old. I mean, who knows? But I think that's one of the things the ombudsman can really help facilitate, um, provide, helping the person do this in service state. Um, so um, then we get into the next paragraph talks about the preliminary consultations that can be conducted without the city having to identify the ownership, occupancy, or location of the qualifying property. And I think that's what you're talking about with the ombudsman. Um, and so we've made this very clear. And then next is the property standards. And we talk about the minimum requirements of the housing code, et cetera. We kind of go down. Um, an inspection will be conducted and the checklist completed when the city of Ohio's building official will meet with the applicant to discuss the necessary improvements to bring the property into compliance with the minimum standards. So once a person has decided to apply and, and had their zoning conformance and we're done with the zoning issue and we start into the building issue, we want to make sure that people understand we're here to help them through the process and identify um, issues and how to correct those issues. So um, with that, I guess, um, we'll kind of skip forward and kind of show you the, the um, on page 8 of 14 is the listing of the checklist. And I just want to ad address this issue right off the, off the bat. It is written in the negative form, lack of this, blah, 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 not in a positive form, because we want, we want the people to get the idea that we want to willow down the, the issues, and we want to have a definitive number of issues for them. It's very hard for the building official to say, yes, you have adequate wiring. That's, that's a catch-all, and he would feel very uncomfortable doing that. But he can identify where they have inadequate wiring or, you know. So it's easier for us to identify the issues than to make a blanket statement that everything in the unit is OK, as you would see a normal ho home inspector does. Correct. Um, so, we have tried to identify um, all of the issues that would come up that would, and, and we hope by making this sort of all-inclusive list, a person would be able to get this who's also wondering, is my unit going to comply? They can read these things and they can say, oh, okay, well, I see, I don't, well, I'm a, I don't have stairs and I don't have, any, you know, I have these windows. I mean, some of these things are kind of, easy for a layperson kind of make, you know, to kind of evaluate their own um, issue and then some of them aren't. So maybe we'll give them a sense of comfort that they can look through there and they can check off a number of them and then now they're down to even a, 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 more, a smaller number of issues that they have to have an expert come and look at. Um, that's what we're hoping at least that by having a finite li list that it's not overwhelming to a person. And so then the next page on page 12 of 14, we have the, the um, in-service date, uh, just a draft, again, this, this solves draft, um, in-service date for the second unit compliance where, you know, a person's going to sign and say, you know, that what they're, what they're going to do, what, that what they've submitted is true and actual or accurate. And then on page 13 of 14 is a sample um, site plan gives a person an idea of what we need them to draw up. Then we would, again, an ombudsman would probably sit down with them and say, you know, if you don't want to spend the money to have somebody do this, you go get, like you did in high school or college, you get the blue, the photo blue graph paper that when you, uh, one square equals one quarter inch or however you did it in high school, you draw it out and then when you photocopy it, the, the graph goes away. <laughs> 
pretty simple. So I think that, that it always looks overwhelming to people, but I've been doing this for a lot of years, at the, and I used to do the counter all the time, and that's how we helped people, is you know this is the most simple way to make squares and show where things are in relationships to the property line. And unless you have a very unique house, most houses are pretty darn you know square rectangles put together, and fairly easy for someone to take a, a, a straight edge and do. And then lastly, we have um, the, the, our standard building permit in the, um, in the um, packet here. And I think that the reason I included this is some cities use their own application. Th this may look like a lot of stuff and they're not, I mean, it's got a lot of places to fill in. And, and it may be somewhat um, overwhelming to the average prop, you know, homeowner. It might be something that is more, we should have our own application for the building portion of the um, compli or compliance program and leave this part to the contractor who's tasked with doing the work. Um, we're, again, I'm just looking at things that maybe seem overwhelming to people and this, this doesn't really provide enough e detail space for us to describe what we're doing you know it's a typical building permit application used more to a, to assess the fees or that type of thing than it is somebody writing down an actual description like I'm I'm doing a second unit da da da, da. so that we might have to have this permit application I'm sorry what this permit application in addition to another Right. application and that's the only reason I put it in there sure. also me missing from this packet would be you know the things that are already in there and I apologize not in here but the fees and that type of thing would also so it gets pretty big when we get done with it and then um, we're hoping that once we sort of finalize the program then we'll have a nice colored friendly um, walk you through kind of handout where it's not these kind of formal stiff um, applications program thing but more kind of like you know done with some graphics and some colors that we can put out and use for outreach for people to understand the, the process maybe oh. a flow chart even right you know that type of thing but I'm not at that point where I can develop that until we kind of go through this so I'm open to any questions you have but that kind of outlays or, or outlines what I've done already um, as far as the program and um, well, I just want to say this. I think this is a huge step forward. I, I, I mean, Thank to you. making this program tractable. I, I really am. I, I think we're closing in on on being on, on getting a program that 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 works. Um, but I am knowing my fellow board members. I bet there are questions. So I'm going to start that up, and I think we'll start on the far right, Mr. Daddy, and go all the way across. Okay. Um, one of the things I would help would think would help on the building permit um, most people are um, comfortable with filling out things online mm -hmm. and there's an asterisk that said this is mandatory you don't fill that out doesn't go through you don't get to buy your present or whatever you want to buy uh, we have lots and lots of things um, I would think for this purpose I'm wondering if it would be mandatory and I'm asking I don't know uh, architect or engineer would be mandatory to have an architect or engineer put in. I mean, what we're doing is we're talking about a building that may have been permitted. Mm -hmm. It may have been permitted for a number of items, and then it's converted. So we start with the fact it was permitted, and then a few things were added that make it non-compliant. And so I'm, I'm starting to look at this and wonder, it seems like there's going to be a lot of things here that may not actually being necessary it looks very busy like high fire fee and park fee mm -hmm. and some things I'm unaware that we actually even have well, I just want to interject and tell you that's why I put it in here because I didn't know if you guys really knew the application this is what they apply with because I think that it's anything but friendly I think we look at this as a day-to-day. -day. We see it all the time. Contractors see it all the time. They're used to filling these out. They know what to skip over, and they know that there's a lot of stuff in here they don't fill out. But if you're trying to reach that, that element that doesn't do this every day, I think we need to have a different application that is much more soft 
and simpler. And then we use this for when they're actually, once they've got done with a preliminary consultation and they've moved into now you need to get a building permit because you need to get an electrical permit or you need to get a plumbing permit, then this should come out um, and then someone should assist them filling it out. So there could be a much more friendly, I think non-conforming so. permit first step, which would be it if no permitted work was needed. And then you'd move to this if permitted work was needing, so it'd be two in effect. The, the, the one right. associated with the non-conforming permit mm -hmm. that didn't involve uh, any additional work, and then this if additional work was required. I mean, that makes sense to me, so I just wanted to clarify that. I, I just think that, you know, this is a, I mean, this is a typical form you see in most cities where someone decided everything has to be on one page because, of, you know, for whatever reason, and so it's very busy and it's very small and, and really tiny spaces to write in and it it's kind of can be kind of overwhelming but it, so. it, it does make sense to me that we basically have one non-conforming permit form for to initiate you, the they're process. fine as it stands and then mm -hmm. another if the permitted works required i mean i think that makes sense to me anyway right um i just want to point out that in the program and i don't know if people all remember this or not because i had a hard time finding it i remember reading it and then i had to come back and find it but um, it really does specify that um, once you're, you're, you're authorized and you actually have met everything, you are considered legal non-conforming. Non-conforming, correct. But legal. And right. so, so the issue would be that at some point, you know, there should be, um, you know, a, a letter or something issued beyond just a building permit that says, you know, Thank you. You've you 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 know your permit, your second unit compliance permit has been approved. Your unit is now considered legal nonconforming. Correct. Um, and that would be a piece of paper that would stay in the file, and then the building permit would be issued from that permit. But then, when somebody, if a lender or somebody called up, or a subsequent buyer called up, we'd say, "Oh, here's this piece of paper that says you're legal nonconforming, and we went through the process." blah, 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 rather than just saying you have a building permit issued. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think it just helps clarify what Absolutely. a person is getting. Yeah. Mr. Daddy, okay, continue. Okay, follow-up question. Uh, we went through this, oh, geez, 15 years ago when we rezoned. We came in with Village Mixed Juice. Mm -hmm. And in 1988, we did the same thing. We decided we'd have no more 5,000-square-foot lots. We adopted Ventura, decided 10,900 was the, what we're going to do. We went ahead and modified the second unit from the state standard of uh, 1,200 down to 640. Again, we adopted Venturas in 1988. So when we get this, whatever the standard is going to be, I'm, I'm really concerned should we lose a unit, have a tree take it down, lose more than 50%, have a fire. Mm -hmm. And now we have this grid here where somebody is 5 foot in the 20 foot backyard setback zone. What then happens? Are they grandfathered in that they own that footprint forever, even though it doesn't meet any current standards, current setbacks? Or are we going to allow them to get back into that zone? Because you know, one of the reasons for the zones is for fire separation. And so what my question is, is based on the schematic we have here with a second unit, five foot setbacks on both corners, which don't apply now. Mm -hmm what will they be able to rebuild back to? Because that's gonna be kind of important on that piece of paper when it says you're compliant is one thing or you're okay or you're legal, but then if you're not rebuildable, um, that's gonna have a big impact on the bank and a future buyer too. So yeah. I'm, I just wanna make sure that when we do this, I would rather have it take a lot longer then get through the process and see that we overlook something and then we have a significant problem where somebody loses a second unit we didn't anticipate it and they don't get to put it back miss well oh, okay. yeah. so the answer the short answer is that once you're deemed legal non-conforming then we move on to the non-conforming section of the code okay and so you know the legal non-conforming section of the code and i'm looking here i, I hope this is do you think this is still accurate, this one here? Okay. Um, so it's going to say, let's see, termination. I want to look and see if there's anything about I'm not sure the standard of how far you can. 
um, if it's destroyed. I've just lost two homes to fire in the last six months. Well, I think you just and want that gets that, to be a real issue. I think the main point here is to make sure there's clarity uh, for people as to the difference between conforming and non-conforming, and, and there is a difference. Okay, so it says, so one section says, I can tell you this one, it says, where a structure is non-conforming only by reason of inadequate setbacks, yard size or open space, structural additions, alterations, or enlargements of the existing structure. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Um, okay. S uh, structural additions, alterations, and enlargements of the existing structure shall be allowed provided the additions, alterations, or enlargements comply with the zoning regulations and standards relating to the structure's building out envelope. And it has an exception. The director may issue a zoning clearance in compliance with Article 19, which would allow the new construction, that's if you're adding on to something, to be built in compliance with the previous or existing setbacks. So I would assume that if you were, if you didn't lose the entire thing, that you could come back and use that section there. Um, and then, is there a section in here about? There's a section in there for the R2 zone, which is a multifamily zone. Mm -hmm. They can build back to 60% or something like that. But for single family, I believe they have to build back to current code. They can't build. And, and that's going to be... And, 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 we're, and let me clarify, we're in the general non-conforming mm -hmm. provisions that apply to anything. And well, that's uh, going to okay. be significant because mm -hmm. the banks are going to base their loan to value on that asset that they may not have. Well, I understand that, but I think that that's true with any non-conforming house throughout the city. These people are not being penalized. They're given the same rights anybody else has who built their house to legal standards at the time and then the city changed the rules. In this case, it's just somebody who didn't have a permit. We're affording them the same, you know, um, benefits that people have. But well, this happens all the time. Now, subsequent to all this, if that's something that w when we adopt the program, if there's something else that you feel is necessary to clarify in the nonconforming section, you most certainly can do that. I mean, that's totally within the, um, <clears throat> you know, Ojai's prerogative, how Ojai feels they want to do it. I've worked for cities where they allow any single fam family home to be rebuilt because they don't want someone to be without their home. And they have stricter non um, rebuild for rebuild for non-conforming for, you know, income producing like duplexes and triplexes and apartments and things like that. I mean, that's all within the comfort le level of Ojai, what Ojai wants to do, you know. But this, so, but this is within the realm of the general non-conforming. It's all going to be the same per, because yeah. we're not going to have a different. A, a separate entitlement. No, yeah. because yeah. when we when we get done, what we want to have clearly for these people is that they're not different. There's We don't want to highlight that some, we want to tell people they are legal, they're legal nonconforming, they don't meet all the setbacks or they don't meet this or that of today, but they're legal nonconforming. Right. People are used to that um, in the in the industry, that loan and, and that type of thing. But he is right. I mean, no, you well, know, that's but that's a general. Uh, Mr. Daddy, I'm sorry. And, Go ahead. And then, Let, and let's uh, the next move part on of here, that. Okay? The next part of that is going to be the uh, footprint, mm -hmm. because again, when I talk about compounding issues, you know, we've got this issue, then we come up with this issue. Now we've got a compounding on top of what I just spoke about. And so what happens is now is you can only have a maximum lot coverage size, mm -hmm. and is that going to then be the same? And that's going to mirror the standard that we're going to waive for the setback. So if somebody is overburdening the lot, mm -hmm. we lose the lot mm -hmm. to a 50% or greater. Mm -hmm. They're going to get back and get to get that rebuild back. Or, Sherry, are we only going to get that 60% on that overburdened property in the back? And, and again, I don't really care what the answer is as long as we anticipate it and we put an answer down so everybody can go to the reference manual and say, now I understand the risk of buying this property with a non-conforming uh, property and something that doesn't meet the requirements. I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to have a second unit half the size if that's what the rules are going to be. It's okay if we come to that determination, put it down so it's clear for everybody, I'm fine with that. I, I don't really care what the rules are. I care about the transparency and the ease of finding out what the actual rules are. So people have a chance to make a determination. That, that, that's mainly what could, I'm after. Could I make this. a suggestion? 
that perhaps part of the information sheet that goes to applicants for non-conforming permit is a very clear explanation of exactly what non-conforming means uh, in, in terms of things like a, a loss. Okay, so I, you know, found I, mean, this that, section, I found this section that Sherry's talking about, and it says any non-conforming structure. Now, we know there's two different things, right? We know there's a non-conforming use and a non-conforming structure. Okay, so non-conforming structure partially destroyed by partially destroyed may be restored provided restoration is started within 180 days of the date of partial dis destruction and diligently pursued to completion. Whenever it's, in it's damaged in excess of 60%, of its reasonable replacement value at the time of damage, the repair and reconstruction of the structure shall conform with all the current provisions and standards of the zoning district in which it's located, and it shall be treated as a new structure. Now, disagreements, it goes on to say, disagreements with the interpretation of these provisions of this section shall be heard and resolved by the commission, subject to appeal to the council. The burden of proof shall be on the owner to demonstrate the cost of repairs is less than 60% of the reasonable replacement value of the structure. Now, I, it's been many years since I had this happen. I'm not in the insurance business, but lots and lots and lots of times these things were written and they were copied and pasted from city to city to city. And what happens is back in the day where people had their property for a really long time and they were assessed, really low, um, of course you're going to go over 60% really quickly if you're taking the assessed value of the house. Mm -hmm. So lots of these are not detailed out with any kind of specificity so that we would know, you know, who appraised or what it was. We just kind of, we would always, it's our, most of the time they say appraised value. So, you know, there's obviously, they've got a nice appeal process in here. Um, they're talking about um, the reasonable replacement value at the time of damage. They're not using the assessed value. So they're giving everybody the benefit of the doubt here. And, and, what, and what I'd like to just speak to, to to try to move things along here is we're actually outside the purview of our discussion here because we're talking about non-conforming use, uh, which is outside of what we're... Oh, and a non-conforming non structure. A non-conforming, mm -hmm. what, I, what I would, I think, urge us to, to try to do is to get back to commenting on what's before us tonight, and I think the point's well taken to make sure that that's part of the information package, that people know exactly what non-conforming is. Right. Uh, and, and, and go on from there. But if we want to start talking about changing the non-conforming use, that's a whole other discussion right, and is. outside our agenda item tonight. It is very much so. You know, so Mr. Daddy, if, if, if that's okay with you, we move no, we on? Need, we do need to move on. Okay. M Ms. Ogre? I think it's really clear um, after these many weeks and months of discussion that the success of the program depends on the perception of the public. So that's what this is all leading to, trying to make it as clear as possible, as simple as possible, to make it something that's attractive to them to come forward to try to, to make their situation you know, correct for them and for the community. So I have a question. Is the city's main, uh, main or maybe one of its main goals still to pro help to provide affordable housing with second dwelling units? Is that still an emphasis? Or no, no um, the city is not. So I, I guess um, um, I should have brought with me and maybe the staff report that went to planning commission. But and I apologize for not having that in your packet. I think we gave you minutes. But um, so we did some outreach to the city's um, consultant who did the last housing element, Mr. Douglas, and he he really got into you know, and I think everyone kind of knows this that HCD, which is you know the state office that reviews the housing elements that nothing's ever black and white with them. And so how they give you credit for units is um, kind of always kind of in a gray area in how you establish. Clearly what they want is they want policies that are not impediments to it, clearly. And so um, I think why the program here is what we need to do, um, and let me just uh, back up a minute. The city manager is very clear that he wants this program um, to be something that reflects OHI and what OHI wants to do and not really push through based on what we think HCD wants us to do. Mm -hmm. With having said that, like I said, once we get through this program and we move into the, the actual ordinance, 
if we keep this same momentum going, and the idea is to remove impediments, most certainly that is going hand in hand with what oh appears to me what OHI wants to do, and would also be consistent with the direction HCD has given cities to do. So I think we're doing everything to facilitate you know affordable housing, but we don't want the um, the program here to um, not reflect what OHI wants. So. We want the goal to be, this is a program that OHI should want to benefit its residents and not really to, we have a certified housing element now. And we obviously want to go along with the, with the intent of the housing, you know, what we get as direction from HCD, but we really want this to be our program. So I hope that answers yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Hilgard, yeah, do you have, a, have more questions? Th yeah, that's helpful. Um, in going around and talking to people, you find a lot of uses for the second dwelling unit and it just what you were saying it is what the people seem to want like the second dwelling unit um, might be for somebody this is sort of the extreme who has a child in school here in the private school and she likes to have a place to come to when she comes to visit the child and that's she rents that place all year so that wouldn't fit under any kind of affordable housing situation um, that's a different situation some people are looking at them as potential um, rental units for um, vacation homes. There are, there are a lot of different purposes for the second dwelling unit. Um, so it, I think a, a big part of, as, as you move further along, a big part of the problem is going to be, um, depending on what program you want them to fit into, who keeps track? I mean, who knows? For example, if you want the owner to live in one of the units, big, the front or the back or whatever, how really do you know if that's happening? All right, so the way it was discussed at Planning Commission, we talked about the deed restriction. We were, um, you know, obviously there was a, there's a requirement for people to register with the city once a year. And obviously that's, we don't have the staff to do that and it's kind of burdensome on the, um, the um, citizenry so the um, modification to that standard was to say you know if, so, if you get if we get a complaint via code enforcement we go out there and say we understand that you have someone living here both of them rented then that's the point in time where that person has to validate to us that they're they're living in one rather than making everybody do this we're going to we're going to narrow it down to those that we get complaints. It's a very small town. Yeah. If there's something going on, I'm sure somebody's going to turn somebody in or somebody's gonna notice that both units are being rented, that they know that the property owner doesn't live there. And then we're gonna go out and we're gonna say, you need to validate, you need to verify that you know this person's living there. We'll deal with that on a case. And that's kind of how they wanted to do it, the Planning Commission. Now, having said about the vacation rental, again, and I don't wanna sound like a broken record, but the idea is to remove, remove impediments. So if we make the program easy for someone to, to make a second unit an affordable unit, it doesn't necessarily mean that if somebody's using it for a different purpose than that, that, that we're still, you know, remember, the state wants us to make it easy for people to do affordable housing. It doesn't mean that we have to preclude some other use of it. But, you know, obviously the intent of doing second units is, you know, the streets are there and the sewers there and the water's there and it, everything. So, you know, the land is there. So they should be lower in cost than, than annexing land and, and, and <coughs> moving out and extending infrastructure and all that. That's, that's the whole idea behind it. So I don't think that we have to be really so much concerned with um, are people going to not do it, use it for affordable housing. I think that's another question for another day, what, what we're going to do with the vacation rentals, which a lot of cities are struggling with. Which is a whole other policy issue. Yeah. But I think we have to keep in mind that what we're trying to do is remove Moving hurdles. Correct. That's all. Then you also, the, the biggest reason I heard, and it just makes sense, is people want a second dwelling unit for a family or uh, any kind of a situation, but mainly for the income to help them pay for their property or whatever. But along with that, you have those units who haven't been paying their fair share, participating in everything the city has to offer, but not paying the fees, the, you know, the sewer cup as it's going along, the school fees and all of that. So ha getting people to come forward faced with that is a huge hurdle, huge. We will have a lot of help. 
Okay. Yes. From another agency. Yeah, it's so. coming. It's coming. It, it's coming. Thank Ms. Hugger, you. Good point. Thank you. I think, um, Mr. Farmer. Yeah. Well, I happen to be one of the 58. I think number two of the 58 that Mr. Daddy referred to the other day, or just a while ago, on the um, second unit. Um, I have happen to have something in front of me here that Wendy dropped by my house the other day, and it's a. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but it's a. It's a manual here set up specifically by the city of Santa Cruz for um, garage conversions and um, accessory dwelling units so that an applicant can kind of review this and see what, it's, um, what it entails. One thing that I'm a little concerned about is from being an ex-retired banker and, um, and uh, is this non-conforming showing up on a title report. I have to, I'm, suspect that'll show up on a preliminary title report and I just don't know how that would be perceived as far as in the real estate industry as somebody uh, pulling the preliminary title report and this showing up on a title report without maybe an education of really what a non legal non-conforming is and I think if we could somehow or another put some wording in there uh, so can I speak to that? Okay. Go, yeah, go ahead. I, I, so, so I just want to make this really clear. There's nothing that the city's doing that would prohibit somebody from legalizing a unit. If someone truly had heartburn over having a legal nonconforming unit, they can always come in and get legalized through all the standards. That's, that's, that's you know, th there's three things. You can be legal, you can be legal nonconforming, or you can just be illegal. And right now we're talking about people who have illegal units that aren't going to get any value for them. We, we, we're saying to people, instead of having to move from illegal to legal, we're creating a midway point for them. Right. There's nothing we can do other than cr making it legal nonconforming. You know, you, you, they're just not going to have the same status as someone who went through all the permits and did, played, did everything they were supposed to do when they were supposed to do it. There's just, and that's all I can explain to you. I think this is the best that we can do for them. If someone still really is uncomfortable with that, they still have the choice to come through and move all the way through. And you know, for some people, once we get done with the second unit ordinance, maybe they'd be able to do that. Because we may, the city of Ojai may make that, that the base ordinance more lenient as we go through this. I think that that's what's coming. That seems to be what's coming down coming, from all this. Yeah. And so there may be people who may be able to actually come in after they've had this legal nonconforming status and say, hey, I can make myself legal and that would be fine too. But as... Um, Mr. Daddy said, there's lots and lots of people who have legal nonconforming houses here in the city of Ojai, and it doesn't seem to hurt them. So this one, it, it, is, it is a status, and um, it would, you know, obviously it's important that somebody who's buying a piece of property understand what that means for adding on or changing use or things like that. They have to educate themselves what they can do with it. But I just want to make it very clear that this is, this is an attempt to help people um, legalize the unit from something that that isn't otherwise yeah I mean that that's certainly how I look at it is is, is establishing an option that isn't there now uh, and uh, removes the impediment per for the HC, HCD policy guidelines so I, I I very much agree with that is you're basically establishing an option we don't have now so I, you know in that respect it, it's a service to the community I think at least that's how I look at it yeah. Um, additional questions? All right. I'm going to skip over myself and go to Ms. Hanson. Um, Tom, if I can just uh, address you, it, that's not a problem, uh, legal nonconforming. As long as it's legal nonconforming, it doesn't hurt the value. You just have to explain it to your buyer because I sold real estate like that. Didn't I don't recall that it did on the one I sold recently. It was legal nonconforming. When we first went through village mixed use, and then we had all these units, like the one the one I had in Kenyatta, it was 5,000 square foot. The parking wasn't right. We had, the garage was built right on the property line, and it was side to side, and there was zero setbacks. Uh, yeah, when, when I went to pull it, that it was non-conforming. But that was maybe within the first six months of the program when we just adopted the new map because Boyd Ford was there and I came in and took over that agency there. 
And, and there were some of those things that were problematic, and we looked at them as a company and said, okay, how are we going to indemnify these things when somebody can't build a unit back? And how are we going to pay for the value when the 1,000 square foot now is 600 feet because of what other constraints they have? And so, I'm going to jump in here because, yeah. again, that's getting off the agenda item into the general nonconforming matter, so I want to try to limit to the so agenda fine. discussion. Um, yeah, so, so. I just want to go to um, uh, attachment A, page one, and right up at the top uh, under general description. I'm concerned about the fact that if someone doesn't uh, do the program uh, for that limited time, uh, then they have to pay all of the permit fees, building construction, all that stuff. But then it, then it says, uh, and there will be penalty assessments. Why do we have to penalize someone? They're already being penalized by having to pay the standard fees that are, uh, I just think that we are, it's just mean. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is what the wording always was. I mean, if you ask me, you know, if I were, I mean, I changed what I felt needed to be changed as, again, as a working draft. I mean, you know, I, my job is to give you something that you can pick apart and hopefully get it refined and make it better. If it were me, I probably would change the word will to may, meaning, you know, these are the remedies we can do, and we may or may not. Um, obviously, the city of Ojai's main objective is compliance. Mm-hmm. So in other words, there's nothing that would prevent a policy of changing the word will to may. No, I mean, that would be fine. I mean, we're just, we're just saying, we're just saying, you know, after the program ends, you may be subject to your, or you will be subject to, well, uh, let's say this. I guess I would say will be subject to the ordinance in effect, but not, but not limited to, I'll permit, and you, and you may be assessed penalties. I mean, I think the may should come before penalties because obviously, you know. In the first sentence. Right. Maybe subject to. And so, you know, honestly, you know, we're just trying to let people know right. you need to come into the program. The city, um, you know, the city does have penalties, but, you know, usually when somebody comes in and they say, oh, I didn't know, blah, 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 I want to be compliant, you know, we're trying to be helpful. We're, well, I, you know, like, I like the word change to May. I mean, so I think it belongs. It doesn't take away any options that the city may have, but it. Okay. It doesn't mandate that the city do something. Yeah, okay, that's is fine. That a, is that? Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. Well, I mean, there'll be more discussion on this before yeah. the recommendation goes to council. So. Um, one other thing on, on page two, where they talk about under modified zoning standards, the lease term, there should be no limit on the length of occupancy. I don't understand that, our rental contract. Why would there be? Because there is in our ordinance. Oh. There's what? She there, said is, there is in our current ordinance. In our current ordinance, there is a there is a ter, there is a lease term. So these are the modified standards. They're saying there is no lease term. I have to say that, or otherwise the other one holds. The other provision would apply. Would hold, would apply. Don't ask me why they're concerned about what somebody's lease says. How can you have a lease without a? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me as a realtor. It makes no sense. So the, I think that what it says. Um, what it says in the in the regular ordinance, I think it says, um, I think it's three years, isn't it, Sherry? It's three years, and so we're trying to say we don't really care. You know, again, we're trying to get out. We're trying to just focus on the things we care about that would impact okay. and not be so burdensome. So what I wanted to do was make it very clear in here all the things that pertained, and so they didn't have to ping pong back and forth between the ordinance and this one. So we're just saying there is no term. Okay. You want to lease to somebody for five years. Go ahead. I see. Okay. You know? That's cool. It is three now. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's something that we're going to, like you mentioned earlier, we may be moving on to reviewing the other parts of the overall ordinance, but we're trying to limit just this, this issue right now. You know, I have one other thing that I'd like to bring up, and I don't know if this is the right time for it, but I, I'm just concerned about forgetting what person has to do to bring their unit up to standard. What are the basic fees that they have to cover just to begin with? I mean, just... To, to apply and to get the final word that they've been now legal nonconforming, other than the work they have to do. Do, you, do we have a... Huh? There's no, there's no I'm sorry, there's no fee to the compliance program? No. Okay. So in other words, a person can just come in here and start the process. There's no opening fee or anything. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. There's an appeal. No, and yeah. a, you mean to come before us? Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Yeah, no, but that, not, not for the program, though. Okay. Um, I was going to ask a question now, but go ahead, Mr. Danny. 
Can we, st I'd kind of like to once we start somewhere to stay there. Modified zoning standards. Yes. E, which is a huge change. Floor area. Okay. Um, I guess a couple of questions. Has, what currently is the maximum? 640. Coverage oh, of I'm a sorry. lot. It depends on what zoning you're in. On the, on the okay. zoning. If I, we have a 4,000 square foot R1 lot, mm -hmm. and we have that on Fox Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the maximum footprint we can get on that? With garage, with everything that's permitted. Okay, 35%. Okay. So those 5,000 square foot lots we have, it's going to be around 1,600. And one can't exceed the other. Okay. Is, okay. is, that, is that too restrictive, 35%? Well, for a lot of these smaller lots, because we've probably that's, got that's a whole other issue. That's we're getting, we're getting out of issue. the agenda right. item again. I just see it on here, and I'm thinking. no, but I mean that gets into the general zoning standards, which is really outside our purview of discussion I mean, tonight. Again, the idea is a person can only build 35 percent lot coverage on their lot, whether it's an addition to a home or a second unit. We're saying it doesn't matter. We're going to let what the community has already decided, which is 35 percent hold and be the driving constraint right and that's what that's what we did i yeah. i don't think that um i think it's f too far reaching to then try to start talking about changing lot coverage no and I, I think we need to not fall into the temptation of expanding the scope of this discussion into other issues you know I'm, I'm, but that, but that person I, let me just say this that person that buys a vmu piece of property should know what they're entitled to they should know i'm i'm held um, by 35 percent. I mean, obviously, that's pretty low right. for something. You know, it's pretty low lot coverage. But um, you know, oh, VMU is 50. VMU is 50. Okay, 50. Yeah. So that's fine. 50 is pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as with everything else nowadays, it gets harder and harder when you have to meet some kind of the storm runoff and things like that. If you're building a house to actually get some kind of footprint on it and still do kind of the things you need to do for stormwater. So modern houses have a really hard time with footprints. That's why right. you see a lot of two stories. But right. um, like I said, just trying to work and loosen the constraints. I think that's, you know, that's, it's a huge step forward, I think, in, in terms of that goal. I have only one very simple question, very precise question. You know, you probably know the question. Uh, attachment A, page four, um, in bold, all compliance units must be retrofitted with low flow plumbing fixtures. Is that something we must have in there? I will let uh, Steve talk to that. Do you know anything about the low flow? Oh, mine won't go that far. You got to get from him. Sorry. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I'm just asking an informational question. It's kind of out of character with the rest of the whole flow of of logic here. I think that I I think that we can talk about it. I think that that was something that was kind of a holdover from what was in the previous. That's program. what I'm asking. Whether that's. Uh, uh, oh, Sherry might know. You and I talked about it because you're like, what's this? And I said, uh -huh. just Probably. leave it in and let them comment on it. There we go. I've well, there commented. You are. I've there. commented. So okay. are we, are we, um, let's have I'm sorry, let's have Steve talk about that then. <clears throat> it would be my interpretation. There's no state mandate to yeah. require a retrofit in an existing situation. Right. If for some reason they were going to put in a new water closet. Uh, certainly. You know, then they would have to comply right. with the current low flow standards right. but, but we, we don't we don't plumbing. have to mandate that someone put new toilets and new plumbing fixtures uh, throughout in order to get a non-conforming permit that would be my interpretation okay. well I okay it seems to me that in the spirit of where we're going with this perhaps that could be stricken so it's only for new. It's only for new. this is well, this this uh, this says all compliance units, yeah, no, but, but I, 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 certainly the, any new construction, absolutely, I, no, no debate on that. Well, I think we're saying the all compliance units must be retrofitted was the question okay. I made. This to strike, could we, if, if that's okay with everyone, we strike that last sentence? Yes. Or recommend to council that we, excuse me. Okay. Yes, in lots of jurisdictions, the water provider makes, you know, 
provides low flow toilets and those kinds of things because they want to encourage people to do it. So well, sometimes I, I, it's not a burden. But, but uh, I, yeah, we're fine taking it okay. out. All right, that was my. Sherry only. remembers that I said the same thing then. <laughs> that was my only question. Um, all right. Well, well, I want to ask: Are we yes. because I have the city attorney here and Steve Stewart, and they came tonight because we anticipated there was going to be a lot of questions about this in-service date and yes. and and the date where we're going to talk about after 2006 current building codes, and yet none, none of that came up. So I want to make sure because I want them here to be able to tell you why it's really important that we can't take modern units. Right. And put them subject to old building codes. And we just no, we don't want to create an entitlement that okay. is in an inappropriate entitlement. I, I, you know, we discussed this. I'll just jump in, and everyone else can jump in as well. I felt that it's, it was. I think I agreed with with Miss Wall that once you get to a certain relatively recent date, uh, that um, uh, you basically should kick in. You know, the building code that was in place at that time should be. I mean, there should be no no exceptions, in other words, because otherwise you're, in effect, um, uh, you know, rewarding people for ignoring, you know, known permitting processes in recent times, and I, I don't think that's appropriate. At least that was one of my thinking. That's part of my, my thinking is, okay, Kathleen, did you want to expand on that at all in well, terms I, of our discussion? I think, like I said, Joe was very kind to come tonight because I think he wanted to be very clear. There was some, the last meeting that we had in September, there was issues about why, why, um, did the city attorney have some issues, so many issues with the change in language? And I wanted to not have to quote Mr. Fletcher, but actually have him here to explain to you. We've now kind of moved forward down the process, and maybe everybody's come to determination that, you know, we're not going to, you know, um, blanketly um, kind of let everyone go under old existing codes, but yet we're going to try to establish in service state and then we've left it at 2006 which of course is a date up for discussion but i wanted to explain that um the 2006 date was what was in the previous program and it just happens to kind of coincide with sort of i think maybe it was done for the the termination of a housing element right. it, I'm it not really coincides sure. with the housing element cycle but i think mr right. stewart has kind of also um indicated that it kind of also kind of coincides with um, changes in building codes that were done in around that time. So so we're thinking that's, that's when the newer standards really kicked in. Okay. Yeah. There were significant changes starting in the 2008 uh, California Energy Standards right. and going before that date uh, is 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 easier to uh, a little bit before the day. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Fletcher, you looked like you were ready to say something. No, just ready to answer any questions about okay. the, the building code. Yeah. And maybe Mr. Mr. Daddy has one. And Mr. Daddy has a question. Um, just so I'm clear and everybody else is clear, uh, and again, I have no issue with the date or what we're going to do. Um, I want to make sure I have an understanding. So when we pick the 2006, if that's the date or 2008, whatever date we pick, then anything built after that that seeks compliance then needs to bring all of the standards up to today. Is that what we're saying? Which would be hardwired carbon monoxide uh, energy standards. We'd need to have all of the different electric and possibly the sprinkler even. I just want to get a clarity that says if this thing was built 2005, you're not going to have to do this. If this was built January 2006, or whatever date is picked, then whatever is on the book today is what they need to go through, and they need to bring it up to this thing to get to legality. And if, just so we understand, again, I'm not for it, I'm not after it, but I think for clarity, and if, if we say that, I'm okay with that. You've got to meet Title 24 across the board, you've got to meet everything else across the board, You've got to meet the new electrical. You've got to meet all these new safety issues. Uh, we have different standards for sheetrock, for firewall, for thickness of doors. we got all kinds of different standards. That's Mr. Stewart, Mr. Okay, okay, uh, Fletcher, ahead. which of you want to take that? <laughs> Very seldom the uh, city attorney defers to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that would be my interpretation okay. uh, based the way this is written that uh, whatever date you pick, uh, after that date, if that was constructed after that, just like somebody coming in 
tomorrow in submitting a set of plans, let's say they're wanting to convert a structure that was a uh, some type of a storage building to now a second unit or habitable space, we would make them bring that up to current code. Correct. Okay. That answer and, your question, Mr. And, Day? Yes. And for the record, I'm fine with that. Okay. I just, I just really want it spelled out for everybody, so nobody has Clarity. an illusion that right. well, I built it here and this was the code. Doesn't matter. And I just think that somebody needs to come up with a date that we can justify and live with. Well, I, I like the logic of that's when the just before the the newer standards really kicked in, the, the order of magnitude changes right in that era, and that makes sense to me anyway. And it makes sense to me that you keep it consistent with what the previous program was so that the citizenry doesn't have us changing our mind back and forth. It was 2006. It will be 2006. Right. And then we're just being consistent. I think that helps. Okay. People don't feel like it's just arbitrary and we're moving it around. Exactly. And I think, and I exactly. think we went back to the um, – uh, we've established that since 1988 the city has had – um, rules and regulations regarding the second units Correct. and then the state did what they did back in 2002 2003 we adopted additional changes in 2004 correct so it all fits perfectly that that we had there's an, that these are the new rules and regulations what the state has mandated and our um, adoption of what we needed to do so that all should have been in their wheelhouse and then by 2006 Exactly. I think it's a good date. Yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, if I could be so bold to try to wind up this agenda item. That's right. Uh, Mr. Farmer? Yeah, I just, I have one question, Kathleen. Attachment A, uh, item G, setbacks. Um, item G says setbacks may be further reduced subject to construction of property rated fire separation walls, but at no time shall it be closer than three feet to the property line? There should be a minimum of five feet buildings up. Can you explain that to me? Which one? All right, which one? Uh, page, attachment A, G. Page three, attachment A, part G. Okay, so, so we're allowing you to encroach into the five foot setback up to three feet, um, but you know, at some point when you get close to a property line, the building codes kick in that's why zoning setbacks are usually, you know, minimum of five feet or three feet, really, in some cities, but five feet, very common throughout the state of California. So you don't have that. You don't kick in that fire separation wall. And then, um, like I said before, there's also our code has always had a setback between um, primary and accessory. And I think it's 10. It was 10 feet, wasn't it, Sherry? So we're letting you go to five feet. But then again, um, you know, whatever you'd have to do to meet the building codes for fire separation, the closer you get, the more the building code kicks yeah, in. Yeah, I view it as a basic fire safety matter, mm. you know, uh, about as close as you can get and still have a reasonable fire safety Within. issue. You know, three feet. I mean, I, I think that's more than reasonable. Yeah. Well, you have to remember, too, and keep in mind that when you have setbacks are usually measured not always, I mean, there's always an exception to everything, commonly from the wall and not the overhang. Mm -hmm. And so some cities specifically say from the overhang, but if you're talking about three feet, you're talking about 18 inches of overhang, you're pretty darn close to your neighbor. And I'm not sure I would. You're touching. So, That's a fire. So danger. you just got to keep in mind three feet and that three feet and that three feet. And within that six feet, you've got two overhangs in there. That's very, very. Very close. Very so close. I just want to make sure that people are understanding I, why. I wouldn't be comfortable any closer than that. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, again, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk about G. Does that include. Um, Car covers, car forts, is, is, is for, for that example, we've got some nice car ports mm -hmm. on Kenyatta, mm -hmm. either side. They're right. very close with the hangover. Whoops, maybe about, oh, a foot from the fence. Is, is, so how do we measure those? Well, you know, we always measure, we have, we should always have very clear measuring guidelines in our zoning ordinance. We do on some things and other things we don't. But again, you know, it should be um, should specify whether the, it's measured from. If it doesn't say from the eaves, then it's commonly done from the walls. But then again, you know, you're not allowed to well, over. There's no walls. It's a four poster. There's oh, okay. Well, from the post, from the post. <laughs> but, 
but well, again, I'm, whatever, I'm gonna, the over, I'm, whatever the overhang is, I guess it just, just depends on how I don't, I've never done one here. So I guess I'd have to look at the code. Maybe Sherry knows. Have you done one? From the exterior wall or the exterior. Yeah. Post. Right. Okay, but again, we're getting into general discussion here that, you know, gen I, I understand. But. And I just wanted to also point out, and I didn't do this and I, um, excuse me for not doing this earlier, but the number of units. So we wanted to be clear, clarifying this, that there shall only be one habitable unit on the site, which includes a food preparation and or cooking area. Additional structures shall be allowed on the same lot with a recordation of a deed restriction that describes the exact use of the structure and agrees to prohibit a food preparation or cooking area. Well, this is a brand new one, and that addresses the issues. Pool house. If you've got an <laughs> artist studio or something else, if you will willingly um, record a deed restriction saying that this isn't going to become another second unit, but I, I want to have a second unit and a primary house, right. but I've got a workshop or I've got a pool house or I've got some other accessory unit, we've now allowed that in there. So the, the quintessential, I guess, example we all have would be the recently um, Mr. Fisher coming down and having too many units on his property. Now, if one were just to become an accessory unit and not two second units, so we don't have three units on the property, we've provided that in there. So we're trying to get out of the way as much as we can, and I don't think I highlighted that one before, and that is a substantial change. And I, and I know Mr. Stewart was trying to say something. I recognize him. I've probably only read this thing about uh, five times since Kathleen and I have been working on it, and uh, uh, but since we've been talking about this particular section, I would like to recommend we strike the word walls after separation and just say uh, properly uh, rated fire separation. Yeah. Because there is other elements. Yeah. Other element to that other than the uh, wall. The, other than walls. Right. I, I agree. Yeah, that's what my question was. I agree. Yeah. You got a good, good catch. Thank you. That's what we're trying to and, do, here and only five do all times. the catches. <laughs> Only read it five times. <laughs> okay, um, I'll make another. I don't, I'm not trying to truncate. I am trying to move things along. Whether we're ready to wrap up this agenda item and move on, I well, I want to say that my understanding, and I really appreciate the structure that's been recommended by Ms. Wald on this, is to bring this basically to put this back into a, a package with the Planning Commission. We're going to be looking at a joint session with the Planning Commission to look at the a, uh, developing a joint recommendation to Council sometime in November 19th was the date, I believe. You know, we don't need to talk about that right now, but there was going to be a time in November was the proposal. So I think that's going to be the next uh, step is to try and uh, uh, have a joint session where we can get a joint recommendation to Council. Did you want to ask if there's anybody that wanted to speak to this item? Yes. Okay. And I'm sorry. My, is there anyone that wishes to speak to this item? I apologize. Mr. Quillacy. My, my uh, mistake. I apologize again. That's quite all right. It, uh, you, you answered a bunch of the questions that I had in the discussion you've had already. I'm sorry, Steve Quillacy, uh, West Eucalyptus Street. Mm -hmm. um, at the outset, I wasn't exactly clear on the, the purpose of the program here. Is this uh, guidelines that you're developing with the goal of modifying the Municipal Code 10-2.1709 and or other places? Or is this a standalone program alongside the code? Because it seems to refer to things that are in the code. But I couldn't tell if you're if you're proposing to change things that are in the code, it seems like you are. You want me to answer? Yes. Okay, thank you. Go right ahead. All right, so this is a standalone, or I could say maybe not standalone, but it's a, it's a companion program to the second unit. So it is mentioned in the code. That actually, if you turn to, I believe it talks about the compliance program in the code. So to answer your question, yes, it is changing the code. But it is a companion piece to the to the actual second unit ordinance. But we are not changing the ordinance. We're not doing that. We're yeah, only not, touching not by the, creating this program. Right. But yeah, you, it, it will eventually spawn recommendations to the city council for it changes has done to the that. Code. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mr. Because Coles, I noticed you, you talked you, about some things here. Right. That I, I have a copy of two 
17. And if you look at near the very end of the second the current second unit ordinance, it refers to uh, this program. Uh, was an amendment to that second unit ordinance in 04. Mm -hmm. At the very end right. there, that refers to by resolution the council adopting a non-conforming program. Right. Okay. And that's what we're talking about here. Yes. Um, you talked about may be subject to penalties, penalty assessments, and I'm still not. Uh, this is in your general description. It's it's still not clear to me why why it would be possible to assess penalties on someone. If you're forcing people to, to come up to code compliance code at some point in time, whether it was when the building was built or if it's current, whatever, um, that seems like a, a pretty onerous thing potentially already. And I, I would recommend that you not recommend penalties in addition to uh, whatever you want to call it that brings something up to compliance. Ms. Well, I think I sense you wanted to say something. Well, I was going to say, okay, so um, <coughs> currently in the city of Ojai ordinances, if a person does work without a permit, so we're not doing anything to a citizen out there, this program addresses people who've done work illegally without the benefit of permit. There comes the penalty. So there's all anybody who does work outside, um, I'm sorry, any, outside a permit, and Steve, you can um, speak to how he uses this. It's a tool that the building official uses to penalize someone who has done work, who's got caught doing work without a permit. When they come in, he can a assess penalties to that permit that they're issued. Okay, so that's number one, how okay. that happens. Okay, so so that's that's part of how you differentiate between people that have played by the rules and people that up to now have not played by the rules. Right, and so what we're okay. trying to say here at the very okay. front is we're trying to say, now's the time for you to come in because we're not charging you, we're not assessing penalties, but if you don't participate in the program and the program terminates on you, then that's what has the potential to happen. Okay. Um, farther down, on this is on the first page of attachment A, uh, under eligible dwellings, um, it says item III shall be the only habitable ex accessory structure on site. Now, during, during the uh, campaign for city council, my wife and I walked up and down every street in this city. I didn't realize that there were as many as there are. Yes, but, indeed. But yeah. There are over 100. Mm -hmm. differently named streets in the city. Um, I noticed uh, one place at least on East Oak and one place on a north-south street. Um, it might have been Gridley, but I suspect it was just a block or two this side of Gridley coming off of Ojai Avenue, that there were properties with three units existing. The one on East Oak, there's a common driveway for six units. And uh, I giving them the benefit of the doubt. I assume that's a double lot and there's three on each lot. But that doesn't seem to be covered here. And I'm wondering what what you call, if you if you have a primary dwelling and you have a, a an accessory structure or a second dwelling, what do you call that other building that has a kitchen and a bathroom and a bedroom and somebody living in it? And is that covered anywhere in the program? What he's looking at is R2 zones that have duplexes, and they're not in the compliance program. Okay. I, 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 was, uh, I was specifically referring to places that I've seen where there are three distinct structures on a well, piece of me, property. Let me just talk to the basic yeah. premise. Okay. The basic premise of a secondary residential unit is that you're not increasing the density that would be otherwise allowed within that zone district, general plan designation. So when the state uh, put this program together, you know, that's why there's limited um, sizes and there's constraints to it. So there's no way we could uh, write a program that's going to allow somebody to have numerous units because it's going to be a violation of the general plan. And, and so the stuff that I have observed is that is that just a, a different zoning? It could be. I mean, Sherry knows the city. Sherry's a, a long time Ojai, and so everyone calls. Oh, and 
R2 allows three or more separate structures on a property. Okay, great. Um, it says on page two modified zoning standards, uh, paragraph D, lot size, there should be no minimum lot size required for a compliance unit. I don't understand. Does that mean if we had a, a 4,000 square foot that it's, you can still build on that? Is well, that what this, this wouldn't, is saying? This would not be anything to do with building. This, this is if is it's it. already there. This is a compliance program that addresses already built units. Okay. But okay. yes, could somebody come in and apply for a compliance um, unit or compliance permit that has an already built unit on a 4,000 square foot lot? Yes, because we're saying lot coverage is the, is the driving constraint. Okay, and, and if the lot coverage is violated by the existing building? Then they don't qualify. What happens? They just don't qualify. Then, then they just remain in the, in the non-conforming illegal category. Oh, well, there's no such thing as not. Well, I mean, <laughs> okay, um, yeah, they would just, they would because just. Because we're talking legal, non, legal non-conforming yes, uh -huh. here, so there must be an illegal non-conforming. Well, I guess so. Yeah. And, and is that where the property <laughs> there's just stays? No, there's just no rules and regulations for yeah. illegal non-conforming. You know, there's not specific. It's just, they're just uh, an illegal unit. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and Mr. Quillacy, well, I right. believe that the planning commission is going to wrestle with that. That's really a, okay. a planning uh, right. commission matter. Of okay. What, I mean, I, I'm just yeah. saying. I mean, we've, I can, we've loosened. The, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was, well, I was just going to say that I think the planning commission was very prone to be looking at something that, that's already built. And, and how to accommodate that. Uh, uh, but I, I think that there is no intent in any way, shape, or form to create any exceptions for new construction at all. No, I, I understand we're talking about existing right. structures here. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, Ms. Wald. I cut you off. No, I did to you. I'm sorry. I, I, I was just trying to say that um, we we loosened the, strength, the standards as much as everyone felt comfortable with, but there's never been an intent to have a no standard unit. And so I think that we're trying to do the best we can to, to address that there are, neighbor, there are neighbors that have rights and property rights and, and they want to, if they bought into a single family zone district, that's what they want to stay with. And that if they bought in thinking that there was 50% lot coverage or whatever, then so we're, we're trying to um, kind of address the property rights of the adjacent people that live next door to these things as well as the people that have um, non-compliant units. And, and I think that um, you know, at, at some point something has to drive and it was really the decision was made that lot coverage. And so before the minimum lot sizes were very large, like 7,500 square feet. So we went from 7,500 down to zero. Right. So I think so we're, I think we're, we're really far reaching That's the, in the this. context of this, you know. Yeah. Okay. And, and Mr. Quilsey. I understand. I'm still, I'm, I'm struggling to get to the point where people can read the rules and not have to go to someone for the rules to be interpreted. They should be sufficiently clarified that an average person just walking in off the street or with a realtor, that, that's obviously always a lot of help, but you don't have to go find a building expert to figure out what the rules are. That's what yeah, I'm yeah, striving yeah. for here. I think that's a, our goal on all of this effort, actually. Uh, my, my property over in West Eucalyptus, there's the main house and there's a garage and I've actually got a shed that's got garden tools in it. Neither of the latter two structures are habitable, but they're closer. I well, they they're, they're certainly closer than three feet. Uh, sorry, closer than five feet to the property line. And I'm not sure about that three foot number. Uh, these are the the garage at least was built in 1929. Uh, along with the house, and I came to talk to Sherry one day to see if the city had any records on the property, and they have a record of the address of the property, and some modifications were made to the house in the 50s or 60s or something like that. Um, am I in trouble, or am I only in trouble if I try to modify my garage? 
Well, I think that... Make it habitable, <laughs> which I don't intend. You're not, you're not in trouble. And I was going to say that, you know, one of the things that, again, without getting into the weeds on this, a lot of thing, that things that we know as professionals that work in this field all the time is we know when the city was incorporated. We know when the city had their first building codes adopted. We know when you get that old that someone didn't go out and build that without benefit of permits. They just didn't need to. Yeah, there <laughs> so was no we're, requirement we're, for we're permits, really, I suspect. We really are up on that. We're, we're not intending okay. to penalize anybody. We understand how old historic units are. This program <laughs> is also addressing people who may have built units more like in the 60s and the 70s where it was common to do so without permits, not because you were trying to do something wrong, it, you just did it. That's just the way the culture was at the time. So, you know, we're trying to address all those things, but no, certainly you're not in trouble with a unit that is that old. I'm gratified. <laughs> um, uh, on page three, item J, it says there should be only, only one habitable unit on site I think we mean one habitable second unit? Right. Okay. Or eligible, habitable unit or eligible dwelling or whatever the phrase is that you use. And I've seen eligible dwelling and I've seen compliance unit. Yeah. Is that is that the same thing? No, I think we tried to go through and change them all. It, it kind of went back and forth and Sherry and I kind of did the fine and re replace. Whatever language <laughs> you want to use, but it was kind of mixed in here. And but I, I think that it's a good point that does need to be clarified because mm -hmm. We're talking about two, <laughs> not one. One additional to primary is the intent. Or, or if you call it an eligible dwelling or a compliance unit, then it's clearly not the primary dwelling. Exactly. Just I think as that's long a, as we're that's consistent a very good in the terminology. I'll add the language in addition, one habitable second unit in addition to the primary. Yes, that would be good. clarifying. Uh, and then uh, on page four, under mm -hmm. property standards, there's the term qualifying property. So again, we have we have something that's different from the other. What was it called over before? It, well, at the bottom it was called a compliance unit. There it's called a qualifying oh. property. Attachment no. A, page Over here four. it's called a habitable unit. Oh, I'm sorry, attachment A, page four, under the okay. underlined heading property standards. Okay, I'll change so, that too. So um, as, long as, as long as the terminology is consistent, I think it's going to be helpful to, that's a very good to point. people that come in. Yeah. Um, Okay. I've got I'm that. glad you I'm glad you took out that last that last thing about low flow toilets. Not that I'm against low flow, but I'm getting ready to sell my condo down in Redondo Beach and I remodeled it two years ago and put in one point five gallon per flush units. You've already changed it. And they've now now when I resell it, I'm gonna have to, to rip all those out and right. put in 1.3s, and exactly. I'm aggravated by that. Yeah. Um, I'm, none of us can fight the state law, um, but, but I'm not sure where you, where you go. Um, is there anything that can be said about that? If, if somebody has a, a 1998 Well, we're taking unit, it out. You know, we're just taking it out. Okay. Yeah. No, but is there, is there going to be anything in here other than meet the code from the time the building mm -hmm. was built? I think our intent is no. Okay, good. Let's see if I think I had one more. Mm -hmm. Nope. Uh, okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you very much for. You've probably spent more time reading that than most of us have. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other comments from the the public? All right. So we'll try to wind this agenda item up again by saying where the intent is to try to have a joint recommend a joint meeting with a joint recommendation to pass on to the council sometime in November. Okay, and I'm going to go for the clarification, which I always do because uh, I'm very busy and I want to make sure I do what you ask me to do. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to uh, try to draft an application form. This is my understanding that this is, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes ago. Right. An application form. It could correct some of these, you know, we have, we've made several notes. I'll do the several notes. Mm -hmm. And then um, in addition to this, we'll add the fees that were on here before. They're building permit fees, you know, they're a right. table. Again, they look overwhelming and a lot of numbers. So, you right. know, 
however you want to do that. And then um, if any, if no one had any issues with, it seems like there were no issues with the compliance checklist, with the affidavit, or any of that type of thing, then. Then circulate that revised uh, uh, document to both Planning Commission and Building Appeals Board mm -hmm. in anticipation of the next meeting. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I think that um, that's I, I think we're making progress here. I, I th yeah, I'm, I think so, too. I'm, I, I'm thrilled. I, I really okay. think we're moving here. Which All right, sounds good. Great. Thank you. All right, let's, let's move on. We have a couple more items. Uh, first of all, I want to um, apologize. We added an agenda item that I just flat out forgot after we started going down the list. So I'm going to, uh, extra, before we get into discussion item number four, we had added uh, uh, board uh, communications, and I'm going to recognize Ms. Hilger because I believe you wanted to state something. Yes, I In terms of general communication. <clears throat> I really, items of concern. Right. I really would like to because I have never personally been approached by so many people about an issue that's been swirling around in the city for the last month, and that's the North Signal Street project. And um, I think anybody who has watched the city council, watched the planning commission, any of the commissions that go on in the city um, has a lot of questions about what all of us are doing what all those people are doing what what the city is doing when a project comes forward that seems to have so many questions that aren't haven't been answered I know um, a lot of people would like to have this put on the agenda so it could all be aired I think the public really needs to have an understanding of the process just just one thought um, People in Ojai walk around a lot, they ride their bikes, they, they go from here to there every day. They see things that are going on, and sometimes big projects that never seem to come before the public, not the Planning Commission or any other board or anything, and they don't have an understanding of why that is when they, who maybe have interacted with the city on a very small project, have spent much time and money and effort trying to get their project resolved. And so I think there's a big area which really needs some attention from the city to, to be discussed so that the general public understands what's going on. Um, I wanted to... What area is that you didn't say? What area? Oh, well, I, I just wanted to... Talking about, oh, do I need to say a specific thing? Oh, spe I said North Signal Street. Yeah. I wanted to add something to that. It's something I've experienced in other cities where, I, you know, our, our family's uh, company's been involved in, in, a, in a sensitive matter that didn't necessarily require a public hearing, but we were advised to go ahead and have a voluntary one uh, just to make sure there was communication going on uh, between the, uh, the applicant and the uh, concerned citizens. And it worked very well, in my experience, that it, it, we don't necessarily, I think one way to address it is to start thinking in terms of having uh, not necessarily required but optional hearings just to address the public relations issues involved in a, in a sensitive matter. Where maybe the applicant says, yeah, I think that, you know, that could be a, a recommendation. The applicant says, yeah, okay, I, I like that. And it's a matter of then ahead of the any any permitting process or any director's exemptions or anything there can be an airing of of um, of concerns and i think that's something to think about it's something that i've personally experienced has worked very well and uh, i just wanted to kind of bring up uh, that thought uh, on I, these matters yeah i agree with that i you think know? one thing that was very upsetting to to have this this uh project come before the the public finally and then the public to be told but the, the uh, time for any kind of an appeal had already passed. So I, that didn't help to uh, make people feel more comfortable about that particular situation. So again, this is not, we're, we're not, act, there's no action item here because no. it, it's just a board, it's just a communication of concern matter. And I think we need to leave it at that to be, you know, properly, um, and, uh, to handle this properly. But I, I do, I think it's worthwhile that we everyone express any concern they have on this matter mr daddy um but leave it at that just expression of concern okay. i would um i guess i would say that there probably needs a little bit better communication 
I, I happened to be at a planning commission meeting a while back, and the discussion was a dead tree. And the dead tree discussion got around to a fairly extensive, very large remodeling of a, of a campus on one of our commercial units downtown. And that was obviously prior to you, but it was a, a, one of these director's exemptions. And I think a lot of people are fuzzy. I don't think they understand what it is. I don't think they understand the oversight. I don't think they understand about clarity. Everything else seems to be noticed in the paper. Um, and it seems like these things happen and they're done and they're moving along. And then people say, I can't remember it before the Planning Commission. I can't remember it before this. I can't remember it before that. And then we find out there isn't any. And it would almost, almost seem that if, if we're going to do these, and th they really have a place. But we've got to put some type of a notice that said, hey, we're about ready to make a director's exemption that says you can tear down and build a million dollars worth of property on the back of this thing here and do all this stuff. And, and I, think, I, I think a number of these things have done a great job. Not all of them, but a number of them. I just think it, the public's concern is that it got by, and they didn't know, and they didn't have the right, they weren't even notified, and there wasn't the appeal in the other process. I don't know if they would have even had legitimate concerns in some of these. It's just not knowing, it's just it, it kind of happened. So with that, yeah. And again, there's no expectation of give and take on this. These are just expressions of concern, not agendized. Uh, any other board communications before we move on to agenda item number four? Uh, agenda item number four is a discussion. Again, not uh, 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 no staff report. Uh, it was something added on for just pretty much us as board members to discuss Ordinance 811, uh, which uh, you have copies of. And um, we, uh, uh, I think each of us uh, wanted to just um, go through and I, I would say Ms. Wall or Mr. Stewart, if you, if you wish to enter into a response, you're fine, but otherwise you don't feel obligated to do so because, you know, I made it, I made it very, very clear you had no time to really do any kind of a staff report on this. Or, but I think what I would like to suggest is that we do a round robin among the board. We, uh, the public, we have a, a, a speaker card here. We basically catalog a series of questions for a future agenda item. Would that be appropriate? that we simply, uh, we basically get on the record a series of questions about this ordinance and its enforcement for future agenda discussion. Would that be appropriate? Um, yes, I would just like to add I don't want to <laughs> put you on the spot tonight because it's not, that's, not, that's not correct. Well, I yeah. just want to, I just, it's, um, what I feel is difficult sometimes to explain to the board and, com and commissions is that, um, you know, the boards and commissions really don't dictate workload, and so that's the issue that, you know, if you want staff to work on something specifically for you, it needs to come through the city council. Okay. And I don't mean to be disrespectful in any no, way. No, no, that's, that's just, perfectly that's, reasonable. So you, perfectly reasonable. you are within your um, purview to um, come to consensus and ask staff to then forward that up. To I city think that's council. absolutely reasonable but that there we is limited staff and and okay. the workload um, can't be dictated by each individual board or commission so perhaps what we do tonight is we try to uh, 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 list uh, put in areas of con list areas of or verbalize areas of concern suggest any board member that wishes to follow up with a, a with a, a document a written document on their particular concerns and then that be simply gathered together and forwarded uh, to the council as a request for this to be addressed I think that's very reasonable all right so uh, it, it, I'm just trying to set the ground rules and then we'll begin we got some speaker cards here um, I uh, would I'm thinking maybe uh, if, if maybe before we do the round robin among the board, maybe we ask uh, for uh, the speakers to come forward first, if that's okay with everyone on the board. And the uh, uh, order of, of received uh, cards here first begins with Mr. Elric. In terms of good evening, William Elric, 487 Gridley Road, and in the interests of 
transparency, I'm a candidate for the school board election uh, upcoming. Um, relative to the vacant property uh, ordinance and Title IX Chapter 15, um, there are at least four properties that I'm aware of that are highly visible uh, in the city that for whatever reason I am not aware uh, in any of the records that I've reviewed have been approached from that perspective by the city um, on its own initiative either by as a consequence of code enforcement or just folks noticing that we have um, several visible properties on Ojai Avenue on Bryant Street that are um, obviously and apparently in violation of this code section. And it is my understanding on at least two of those properties that they have not been found uh, in any kind of violation. And uh, at least one of them has been maintaining a architectural review through the Planning Commission uh, renewed on a regular basis for something along the lines of um, 12 years, 17 years, etc. Uh, I would uh, say that I ha would support that um, situation being changed uh, from the perspective of an active approach to enforcement of this particular code section of the municipal code, particularly because of their high visibility and also because I believe that we're there are properties with such high visibility that are allowed to maintain themselves in violation of the code for such a long time period that there is a unfortunate message being conveyed. I appreciate um, that um, this uh, uh, board cannot effectively um, enforce or initiate enforcement of these code sections, but I would also like to say, in, and specifically because it's so uncharacteristic of me to uh, appreciate your uh, work and your approach to uh, the business that is before you, because um, there is a marked, in my perception, there is a marked difference in how you go about the business of, that is before your board, but as well as um, uh, reaching out beyond what would may be the obvious limitations or apparent limitations that are set forth as indicated by Ms. Wald relative to uh, actions necessi necessitating uh, uh, determinations made by the City Council. So uh, on that note, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Quillacy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Quillacy, 516 West Eucalyptus. Um, I actually, I have been through Chapter 15 of Title IX in, in some detail, and I don't necessarily want to bring all that detail to the attention of the commission, or the board, excuse me, the board, uh, this evening, but I would like to know where I can communicate the questions that I have, and then I'd like to ask you just a few questions. So you should answer I answer the first question, or yeah, that's my first question is where where do I specifically ask detailed questions about detailed provisions in the code? May, may I be so bold to suggest something that you direct those questions? Uh, by email to Ms. Wald, okay. copying the rest of the board members, so okay. we are aware of the questions being asked, and we can see and we can see her responses. Is that fair? Well, I, I think that's more than fair. I just want to remember, please remember that Workload. you're, an, you're yeah. an appeal board, okay? Right. There are some issues that may come before you on appeal. I, I don't know that engaging you. That's, oh, I see what you're saying. That's a good and point. And your email, you, you're asking him more, to, to. Then it would be more well advised to limit that exchange between you and Mr. Quillacy? That's what I would suggest. Again, I, I, I a see reply your point. All and is I, not I, I think it's practice. well taken. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. this, this uh, Title oh. IX, Chapter 15, is the, uh, I'll use a military term, Office of Primary Responsibility 
within the city. Is that the is that the community it's, development it's the community development yes department? And what board is it? Is it the planning commission that no. is most uh, responsible for yeah. this, or is it this board? Title IX is uh, in terms of advising the board, the city council. Yeah. Uh, this board is tasked with advising on uh, issues involving code in Title IX. Okay. That's in terms of the written code. But I would, I think that that Miss Wells' well, points well taken that. In terms of very specific matters, I, I think probably an exchange just between the two of you would make more sense because we don't want to be in a position of having our quasi-judicial function tainted by some sort of specific uh, uh, property issue that you have uh, gotten into an exchange with. Okay. You understand I'm, what I'm yeah. saying? I'm not dealing with any of my own personal property. Well, I'm talking about but, but another buildings. property uh, owner may make an appeal to us on something associated with title nine okay uh, relative to the vacant building ordinance conceivably and so I, I would uh, that's my my own I think the concerns well taken that if it's a specific property you have question about it'd be best to get into a one-on-one a -on -one. okay well some of it is about specific properties and, and okay. as as you know sir Mm -hmm. uh, from our first candidate forum, I began talking about yes. the bowling alley, and, yes. and that's become an increasingly popular topic of discussion. Right. Um, so that is one particular property, but I, I, I have think a general, number of questions. Let's get in some general questions here. Yeah, then. I have general questions about let's, the code. I should still send those to Ms. Wald? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But um, if you have some uh, general topics that we want to bring to our attention, please proceed. Um, you know. No, I, I think, uh, I'm, you know, I'm asking about uh, there are requirements in the code that certain things be done. Right. That a registration fee be enacted by the city council. I recognize this. Yeah. That's not under your power, but I'm, I'm wondering if anybody knows about may, that. May I make a suggestion? Yeah. Why don't I exercise my prerogative to allow you to come forward again after you've heard our round robin of questions okay. to see if we missed something? That I'd you'd like it. to bring to Thank our attention. Thank you very much. I'll do. I'd be glad to do that. Because I think that some of these things are we have questions about as well. Great. Okay. All right. I'm going to start over here this time, and allow Miss Hansen to lead out with her particular questions mm -hmm. and concerns that we're basically airing out in terms of, of discussion amongst ourselves without necessarily putting Miss Wall on the spot. Yeah, not meaning to put her on the if spot. If she wants to weigh in, or Mr. Stewart, you want to weigh in, please feel free, or Mr. Fletcher. But again, we're trying to be very, dis you know, because it wouldn't be fair to you because this was added as a discussion item for just the board members. I see that on page nine there is this discussion about local property management requirement. Are any of the properties, do, it, do you happen to know if any of the current properties that are vacant and blighted, are there any... Um, Pro is there a property? Ma I, I know a property manager that might be willing to do this, but I don't, I don't know if that's currently being done. Are there any property managers that are reporting to the city on? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Right, we're not, we're not, let's not necessarily. Okay. They haven't had time to research everything. Oh, okay. But this would be, I think, better stated as this is a concern you have. That is a concern that I have. you'd like to have further information, uh, information about it. in the yes. future. I mm -hmm. think that would be the way to state this. I probably have other concerns, but I'll let you go okay. forward. <laughs> I just want to preface this by saying that, you know, anything that we do in code enforcement, just want everybody to understand this, that, you know, like the list that we give out to um, the Planning Commission, we are limited when we have an active case about what we can discuss. Okay. So this is not for public hearing purposes. We don't exactly. get into that's, that's what, what that's letters saying. we're sending to people. We simply say we can tell you what's on the list, if it's active, it's not for instance, the code enforcement list just lists the street name. It doesn't even tell you the cases. So I want everybody to understand this isn't right. one of those issues where everything is transparent. Code I enforcement. That's what I'm trying to be careful about. Right. Code enforcement is a whole different animal, and it is. Um, there are things that we don't disclose. So just the way it is. No, I understand. And so Sherry can tell you um, that my understanding, just from a from a just a to give you an idea that we get people registering vacant properties, most of them are residential, are they not? And they come in for when bank owned, when there's a bank owned property, they do apply. Um, so that's kind of the people that use the program right now. 
There are people who are looking at this. These ordinances appear to have been written. I wasn't here in 2010, and Mr. Fletcher and I were talking about this. Um, a lot of cities implemented these kind of ordinances back in the day where there were a flood of foreclosures and a lot of people living next door to a house that weeds got high and there was nobody there or maybe right. had a pool or whatever. We want to know who we could contact and that's who we see using this program on a, on a routine basis. And, and just to follow up on your, your, one of the things I'd like to know about for the future is particularly on something like inspections. You know, do these go into the building file, like inspection reports for building permits go into the building file or not? Again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to stay away from getting all these questions, but that's one of the questions that I have, yeah. is what goes into the building, what goes into that particular property file with respect to the vacant building ordinance and what does not? Yeah. That's a question I have, you know. So, go ahead. Well, that's all for right now. That's all I was okay. really curious about. I mean, a lot of concerns but. Right. Mr. Mr. Chair yes. just to kind of add on again what, we're not trying to say you have to no, answer no, no, things no, okay. I understand yeah um, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox that we can utilize in bringing buildings into compliance this just happens to be one of them and so I will say that we are looking at a number of uh, of uh, structures in the community uh, in evaluating how we wish to proceed and, and I'll leave it at that so I just want to clarify that there's other means of bringing compliance yeah. thank you um, I'm gonna again skip over myself as chair go down the line and then if no one else has asked my question I'll ask it mr. Farmer well, I think you. I think you might have just answered one of my questions regarding because one of my questions was the bowling alley, and I, item uh, page four, owner responsibility over the over the ninety days, and I was wondering what's been happening with you know that's been a long time over ninety days. No, not necessarily appropriate that they answer that. Oh, okay. okay. The way we structured this today. In other words, I, I better state it that's something you'd like to know more about. Right. Yeah, and I'd like to know more about um, okay. the um, page seven um, identify buildings which become vacant. Um, item three: initiate proceedings against the owner of any vacant or dangerous building found to be substandard as defined. One specifically that comes into mind is the old uh, Mandalay building down here that has had a, and I don't know what's happening, but it's had a dozer sitting in front of it for quite some time mm -hmm. and the and the walls are just are tilted up in the back back there to me that would seem hazardous okay i, I was well, just going to say we can speak to that one yeah we can tell you that one that one actually has an active building permit they pulled their building permit october 10th 2014 you know it's 20 days old or so so there there's no abandonment or vacant property that that's a that's an in progress mm -hmm. um project um, and so I, I don't know if you have anything else to say about it but that's kind of where it is at this point but they came in requested a demolition permit and it's on file uh, part of the requirements of the demolition permit was to provide in temporary bracing which you which you see and they are uh, planning on doing a phase uh, development there they've already pulled the permits for their phase one and then they will be looking at additional phases at some point. So that is an active building permit app that we're working on. Okay. Mr. Farmer? No, um, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Hilgar? Um, I think this just shows that we're all interested in this topic and it seems there are a lot of properties which everybody could name that have been in poor condition for quite a long time. So just kind of focusing attention on it. I know you're swamped, everybody's so busy, but it's just something that you could, you could list, I mean, I could read every single thing on here and you could stand in front of 20 lots and say, yeah, that doesn't work. That's a, so I think it's just that to show interest. And yeah. thank you. <laughs> Mr. Daddy. Uh, I guess. Mine would be for all the way down to the end of the table. 
Uh, it was asked of me. Um, had somebody call up and talk to me about one of our most favorite topics. Uh, security requirement C, no chain link or plastic fence. And, and the question was, did we grandfather any of these units to where they had a chain link fence before the ordinance, they still have a chain link fence after the ordinance, uh, they still don't have a sign posted about management, it's, it's still not visible. And now the for sale sign's got graffiti on it, okay? And I sent all those pictures in. And so what I'm wondering is, is we have a particular unit on Bryant Street. I went around and I took pictures of a dozen. And I have one on Bryant Street and I thought, my God, I have never seen that thing open since 95. And it's not one that catches everybody's attention. It's huge, it's kind of stealth. We have some that are even older than that. We have a four service building next to Casa de Lagos that is set back, which is great because it's got a six foot fence and shrubs right on the sidewalk so it doesn't meet the three feet within uh, whatever. And then I went next to it and there's a motor home that's been parked there for about a year as, a, as, an, as an additional house. And, and you just kind of start looking for these and you go, oh my God. You know, we had about 20 of these things around here. And what I'm wondering is, is are any of these things grandfathered pre four year old ordinance that we have where they get to keep these things that were in place or are they gonna need to comply to this regulation that came after their blighted condition was there? I don't know. There's my, I, I, I don't know. The question about really about grandfathering would be the one if, if a property, if, if depending on the zoning of the property, if a chain link fence was permitted in an R, you know, an M1 zone, um, maybe it's still a legal fence. Um, you mentioned the Forest Service. You, th that's a federal property and we don't have land use regulations. Over wow. If it's if it's owned by the Forest Service. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a Forest Service lot. It was used as a Forest Service garage and a Forest Service. It's in between the American Legion and, and Casa de Lagos, and it's set back in that lot. So I don't know that the, it's government property, but I know it was a prior government use. It could be a private owner that owned that building. Right, and I don't know. vacant for years, broken windows, things of that yeah. nature, yeah. which, which kind of meets the criteria you're, we're looking for. Right. But, I, 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 I you'll be at the. I'd have to work with the staff in terms of property by property. Um, the main purpose of this statute, the, uh, you know, there's really two things. There's one is the bank-owned property thing we went through. Um, and I adopted ordinances of this in other cities too. Dealing with the bank-owned properties, primarily residential areas, uh, for property maintenance purposes. The other one is basically a, a dilapidated building ordinance um, that requires property owners, commercial and and residential to maintain the property in the same level of condition, whether it's occupied or not occupied. We can't make people occupy property. We can't make people sell property. We can't make people put some a tenant in it or sell it, but we can make them keep it in the same, same aesthetic condition as it would whether it was occupied or not. Right. Um, I don't have any comment about historic practices and, 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 and where we stand in terms of those. Um, and the grandfathering is a case-by-case -case basis. I can tell you one thing in the case of the bowling alley, that is a construction, that's a rental fence. That's not, that exactly. would, it never would have been a legal fence as far as I can tell. I don't know, I mean, by the zoning, it's a construction fence someone put up there. The issue you face with those is, is, is a, um, uh, a security issue. We, we, you know, if you read the, some of the purposes behind the ordinance, we don't want vandalism, we want people living on property and cooking and having campgrounds. On the other hand, if we, people can't effectively fence the property, it's going to become a, an attractive nuisance and potentially have people doing that. So I think in some situation there's, you know, there, there's trade-offs on, on, um, on which is the better way to make sure the property is safe. But that one we know is, was a, it's a rental construction fence. It, so I can't fathom how it could have ever been, been legal. If I, if I, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna key right off of that is, I, I, I've got to comment, again, I'm gonna try to stay to my own rules here, amongst us, uh, that um, the purpose of this is to address vacant building problems. So if you think about it, if you consider anything that was already in existing condition as grandfathered, it completely defeats the purpose of why the thing was passed in the first place. 
Uh, so I, I have a real problem with the whole idea of grandfathering when the, it, it seems to eviscerate the whole purpose of the ordinance in the first place. Um, and so that's my, my first comment that I want to make for, again, discussion of future agenda items. Second of all, it, I have an, an interesting, I, I just really want to understand for future reference and future discussion how absolute statements of will and shall are reconciled to staff workload and, and enforcement discretion. I think that's, that's an issue that needs to be kind of understood. And if there's some, for example, some, some absolute mandates in something like this that need to be in this, in this uh, Ordinance 811 that are unreasonable, like the absolute statement, fencing shall be permitted but only with consent of and under the direction of the director, no chain link or plastic fencing shall be permitted. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So if that's not a reasonable statement, then I think we, we need to be looking at considering as a future agenda item changes to recommend to council on this because, again, I do not think it's appropriate for there to be mandates and ordinances that are simply ignored. It's better practice to change them uh, if they cannot be followed for one reason or another. Um, the mandate, for example, of uh, uh, the, uh, the posting with 24-hour contact number, uh, clearly not something that if it wasn't there when this went in place to be considered grandfather, clearly that's supposed to be on the vacant property. Clearly we have years of those signs not being on a vacant property. Uh, the purpose being that people can, you know, there's very specific language here in terms of this property managed by, to report problems or concerns call, has to be a 24-hour number, has to be a certain size. These are not discretionary matters. And, and so I, I, I think that whole issue of how we deal, what, what should be our practices regarding mandates in ordinances that are not being followed, and maybe there's a good reason they're not being followed, but then we need to look at how we in, instill some discretion uh, or whether there shouldn't be any discretion. The other comment I want to make is that we did, uh, the council did um, make a, um, uh, made a hiring decision last night for additional enforcement activity, additional enforcement resources. And Councilperson Blatt specifically made the point that I hope this includes vacant building ordinance enforcement. And that was very, very specifically stated by, and I think that that also um, addresses the issue that some of them that I'm raising. And then two more things. One is I would like clarity as to what goes in a building file uh, and, and not in a building file with respect to this Title IX matter. It, with respect to registration, paying of fees, monitoring, uh, abatement plans, et cetera. Uh, I think that's something I'd like to have more clarity on in the future. What, what is a public record and what it is not a public record in that regard? And finally, just trying to make trouble a little bit, I caught something that I thought was a little interesting. On page four, it states, vacant means in definitions for a single-use occupancy building structure where there exists no legal occupancy. I thought to myself, my goodness. So if we have a residential property in a residential zone that's only being used for vacation rental less than 30 days, that's not a legal occupancy. Um, anyway, just a thought <laughs> that I wanted to, to share. Does that mean that this, by definition, classifies that use as vacant, and therefore this ordinance applies. I'm not asking for an answer. I just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> and, uh, and with that, I, I, again, I think that uh, I, would, I would ask that um, uh, this be put on a future agenda for discussion and, and, and possible development of recommendations to council. Um, and. Uh, we, um, we, we simply leave it at that. I think mainly we, everybody wanted an opportunity to uh, express themselves on this, and then I'll, if we're done talking, I'm going to go back to Mr. Quillacy if he feels there's some issues we did not bring up that we should be thinking about. Thank you, sir. Um, 
if I understood the previous discussion, it is that um, it's, it's ex I, I don't want to say acceptable, allowed, whatever. Um, it'll be fine if I ask uh, written questions of Ms. Wald that are of a general nature, but if they apply to a specific piece of property, that that's covered by privacy restrictions or something? Did, did I get the wrong impression? No, I, I, if I could be, I think what she meant is it better not to share that with the rest of us and direct it just to her. I got it, okay, okay. okay. Is that correct, Ms. Wall? Um, yes, but if there's something that's been turned into code enforcement, he is also correct. I, we can, I can only tell him it's an active case. Right, it's up to her to okay. answer your question. Okay, so I can ask questions as specifically as I wish. And she can, and, up and to her. And you sometimes will be able to answer and sometimes not. Exactly, correct. yes. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I think you, you pretty well covered everything else. There, there is one uh, that I asked Mr. Fletcher about last night before the city council meeting. And that's in uh, 91510C2. Oh, and I printed my own copy of Chapter 15, so I'm not what, sure what page it's on. 915. 1510C2. It's on page 10 of this ordinance. Oh, page 10, correct. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, where it says maintenance of the building, maintenance defined, maintenance of the building in continuing compliance with all applicable building and other applicable codes. And, and we talked about this briefly before the city council meeting. The phrase continuing compliance is still something of a mystery to me. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand if building codes or other codes are changed, does a vacant building have to be modified as a result of this phrase, continuing compliance. Would you Ms. like to jump in? Mr. Actually, Fletcher? I've given more thought to it after our, our chat oh. last evening. Um, in looking back at this, that what this is, what this says is that the building must at all times be in compliance with applicable codes, including the building code. And falling out of code compliance um, would would there be grounds for a viol violation of, of that's one. That's one element of um, not adequate maintenance. I don't believe that the purpose of this was to change the, the law. The general law is that buildings, the building code applies to construction. At the so time of it, construction. At the time of okay. construction. Now, very likely would be, and one of the issues you do have with, with vacant buildings is the issue of our topic for the evening, nonconformity. Mm -hmm. So if you have a vacant commercial building, that was one particular occupancy that had certain exiting and fire safety and all kinds of, you know, in the commercial industrial area, there's all kinds of different occupancy regulations about, about, um, about commercial buildings particularly, that if that, that is vacant for a period of time and the use has changed, they may, they'll have to come up at the time the use has changed, they may have to bring it to then applicable codes because they lost any nonconformity right. because it's been vacant. Okay. So... Um, but but it wouldn't it it it, we, it, it wouldn't be a, um, a rational interpretation to say that we intended by this to change the general law, which is the building code applies at the time that at the time of construction. Okay. Could I well, ask a related question just above this one? Yes, sir. Uh, item four, A four, just above that on page ten. I think this is related. It says shall be landscaped and maintained, visible front and side yards in good condition, and no less than the standard of those properties within the same zoning designation at the time registration was required. Does that mean that if a property becomes vacant and registration is required, that the existing landscape ordinance applies at time of that, registration? That seems to be the intent of that language. And, okay. And unlike wanted, building codes. That so I was yeah. Yeah. interpreting that. I'm, I'm not, yeah, right. I'm just, maybe it needs to be changed, but that's how I'm interpreting that language. Yeah. And, and again, I, I was struggling for clarity with Mr. Fletcher last night. Um, I don't believe that continuing compliance is used anywhere in the municipal code if you're talking about existing non-vacant structures. Mm -hmm. You know, if the code changes, those of us that are there already, my 85-year-old house um, doesn't have to change necessarily. Um, but it sounded like a vacant building would have to, and, and that's, 
time. One more. But I'll, I'll have a lot more questions for Ms. Wald. Yeah, I think we'll be a future agenda item, and we'll all have more research into this. And Terrific. We're going to be going into this again. Thank you very much. I'm just I'm striving yeah. for clarity so that, one, the same rules apply to everybody. Correct. And, two, that the rules are understandable by everybody. Right. So thank you very exactly. much. Exactly, which I think is a common goal. All right, are we ready to um, wind up the evening? Yeah. We have one more item, if we're okay with this. Uh, sorry, I was, gonna, I was gonna get to future agenda items and then give our mayor a chance to speak. Um, would, would you like to address some concerns with us so now at this point? Or? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, future agenda items is something we have one for already for, which is the issue of two-story uh, second units. Uh, are there any additions to future? I would like to add in, uh, enforcement of Ordinance 811 to a future agenda item, uh, personally. Uh, sure. At that point, we'll have the new enforcement officer by the time. Uh, the, uh, well, basically, a discussion of the enforcement of Title IX, Chapter 15, as a future adjustment, a future uh, agenda item. Uh, well, let's put, it, let's put it this way. That's not our job, enforcement. Our job would be to re a review f with respect to any um, recommendations to council. What's the two-story thing? Uh, Title IX, Chapter 15 of the Ohio Municipal Code. You want to add two stories to that chapter? Uh, well, that's already on here. Uh, future agenda items is two-story second units. Mm -hmm. That's already on there, and I'm wondering if we should add another. Yeah, I know I saw that. I can't answer the question. So can I? Can it, I it's I, just on here. Okay, so <laughs> that, was brought, that was brought up by um, Mr. Dotty, the two-story second units. So did we answer with the new compliance program? Is that not a question at this point with the second story i really don't know mr daddy would you like to keep this on as a future agenda well, item I, th I think what my issue had to to be with was these restricted very small lots and we're bumping up against footprint and so now we're having people go high and when you have these little tiny skinny lots and you've got right. these tall buildings you get into a number of other items and I think you know we need to take a look in, at at some point in time in terms of the you're going to run into the solar and you're going to run right. into the view and you're going to run into but these other things we're talking about new construction yeah we're talking about where people want to buy some of these right. smaller properties throw in a second right. story and I think maybe uh can I, can I just ahead. interject yeah. that since we've kind of separated these issues out that's right. kind of more a zoning issue I think maybe you okay. can I agree. Throw that over to the planning. It's not commission. a building code issue. That works um, for me. But yeah. I also think that I just want to say that we still have a provision in the code that allows people to do or citizens to apply for second units, and they could go through that discretionary, you know, design review permit. So we're not prohibiting them. Right. So I think I think maybe maybe this is best be struck as a planning commission issue. Yeah, that's fine. One other item to add. Yes. Uh, we have allowable uh, structures that are permit exempted in unlimited numbers. So somebody can have you got the you got the amount of property you can put a hundred, hundred and twenty square foot sheds on your property. I believe, Mr. Stewart, correct? As long as they're less than twenty four volt electric, they are exempt from permits and they're not part of the coverage. I'll leave it to that. We can study that, bring that back for a future uh, item. What, 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 would, what would be the title of this agenda item? It, it was something that was brought up when uh, Mr. Mullane was here, and we brought up a number of people having a large number. Okay, is that a zoning or a code issue? Uh, is that a Title 10 or a Title I, I, 9 issue? It's, it's a non-permitted structure. Would it's that be exempt a, from permitting, so I can't okay. tell you. Okay. Okay. I want to make this very clear because we have this happen with 1105 over and over and over again. People have to understand that the zoning ordinance is in play all the time, regardless of whether or not you need a building permit. Right. The fact that someone says to you, 
oh, you don't need a building permit for that, doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want to do. You still have to get zoning conformance. Right. So That's why there's asked- kind of a misunderstanding in this community when people say, well, I went into the plant, I went into the community development department, and they said, you know, I don't need a building permit for a six-foot fence. You still have to make sure that you know what the zoning rules and regulations are and where it goes right. and where it doesn't go. Mm-hmm. Now, that's just the way it works. And what happens often is that those people end up in abatement because they feel that, oh, I was told I don't need a permit. I can do whatever I want right. to do. They don't understand there's still a zoning issue. Correct. Yes. And so the fact that those accessory structures don't need a building permit doesn't mean that person gets to do whatever they want to do and they're still not obligated with lot coverage and all these other standards where it goes. And, yeah. Um, so we have to do a better job of telling people when they come in, do I need a permit for this? Well, no, you don't need a building permit, but you do need to talk to me about what you're doing, and I do need to give you zoning conformance or zoning so that's compliance. that's a, 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 a so, zoning matter. So, so I want to make it very clear that, you know, we're working on that. We're working to explain to people that, that no building permit does not mean no rules and regulations. Right. Okay. And, and, I, and so that's a, an education improvement we need to make. And if I may add, uh, sir, um, even though there's a building permit that's not required, the code still requires that that be built in compliance with the building code. Okay, uh, correct. Yeah, exactly. In other words, you you still can't string extension cords for your power. So I think at some point we're going to have to have some handouts and some things maybe on our website that tell people, hey, I want to do a fence. What do I have to do even though it's not required to have – or a wall. Well, and I, I think that's a good point. I it's think a, we it's, need a, to it's do an that. executive issue. We need to do a better job in terms of information at the desk. All right. Ready for Ms. Mayor Strobel? Yes. Do you have comments? Yes. So, no, Are, no uh, we're we're going to have the Title IX, Chapter 15 yeah. discussion. But not enforcement. Not enforcement will be a review, a review of with respect to possible counsel, recommendations to council. Sorry. Well, I'd like to start off whining. I like that a lot. Um, I want to go back earlier in your meeting. Um, it was commented by Kathleen that the council would have to approve workload. So I want to back way up and tell you that the city council conveys its priorities and goals to the city manager. The city manager distributes workload. So if you have something you wish to discuss and there may be a workload issue, Kathleen can take it to the city manager. The council has already given its rules. And did you want to? Well, I was just going to say it's a little confusing for me, too, because I knew this was coming forward, and so I asked the city manager about it. And that's how he, um, unless I just misunderstood what he said that um, if you were going to give me um, workload and, and oh. work on something, and that it, I, we would have to take it forward to the city council. So my apologies, because that's how it was, you know. So maybe I just misunderstood. And what's really important about that is I'd like, um, I would like everyone to have clarity, the uh, board members to have clarity. So maybe we can invite Mr. Clark to attend the next meeting and explain how the, the workload is handled. Because the, what I've just given you is accurate, I believe. Yes. OK. So I'm going to move on. That's, that's it on my whining. Thank you. OK. I was really delighted last night when the council approved a 30-hour um, code compliance officer position. I was also very delighted that Mayor Pro Tem Smith included in her motion to review in six months to see if 30 hour a week code compliance officer was adequate. Had it been left to me, I would have gone straight to the full time code enforcement. Because, well, I won't even get into that speech. But um, I agree we need to have attention paid to enforcing the codes we have on the book. So this is a start. I probably 
personally would have wanted it even heavier, but this is where we are. The good news is in six months, we'll review it and see if we need to expand that role. So we're aware. North Signal Street, we had a full house. <laughs> and we listened for a long time to many people, some in support, some in opposition. Um, and collectively, I correct me if I misstate this, collectively, the council has asked the city manager, city attorney, to take a look and see in what capacity the council can place that issue on the agenda. Yes, I believe that was your action. Now, uh, and we went through, it was a director's exemption, and that uh, time for appeal has expired. We've, we've gone through all that. But as a lesson in public education, public clarity, if there's a way we can put it on the, the council agenda so that the public can come in and talk about it, then that's what the council has asked be done. Be sure and vote on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. We have candidates in this room. Yes. And remember that um, we have a ballot box in the lobby of the City Hall. That ballot box will remain here at City Hall. You may deposit your ballots in that box up until, I believe, Rhonda said 5 o'clock Tuesday. So if, if your polling place isn't convenient and you haven't already mailed your ballot, you can walk it to City Hall and drop it in the ballot box that's here. But what's really important is that you vote. The last thing is after taking almost three weeks vacation, I find that it's really difficult to jump back into the cold waters <laughs> of structured <laughs> meetings. <laughs> but I'm, so I'm slowly getting back into it. And that's about all I have. If you have any questions for me. No, I, I think you jumped in very well. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank and you very much. It's always such a delight to attend this board meeting. I, it's really an exciting board. I like the, uh, the way you argue, state your views. Um, all of these different perspectives is just really educational for me. I enjoy it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Strobel. And thank you, the three of you, for attending tonight. I, I know it's a, it's a major, you know. Very exciting demand on your time, but I think it helped us all get educated as to the major issues. So thank you very much, and I believe we are adjourned. No, I... I I started reading up and I thought, no, you're We're on TV. I'm not sure we want to do it. I really do. I thought we'd just do an email blast. Yeah. 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 Yeah.